Good morning, everyone. If everyone can make their way into the main auditorium, we're about to begin. Oh, it got very quiet in here. I could hear a pin drop. Thank you for being here today in beautiful Hot Springs for the 2019 Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Summit. How many of you are returning today? A lot of familiar faces in here. And how many is it your first time? Love that, love that. I hope to see this room continue to grow every single year. My name is Laura Monteverdi. I'm the morning anchor for Wake Up Central on THV 11 this morning. And yes, before you ask, I did work this morning. And yes, I will be here all day long. Check on me about one o'clock because that's usually when I take a nap in the back room. Thank you again for being here, those who are new and those who are returning again this year. Whether you are a physician, a nurse, a politician, law enforcement, a person in recovery, or maybe even a grieving mother, brother, father, sister, or friend, addiction and drug abuse has most likely affected you in some way or another, and that's why you're here. We're here to listen, we are here to educate, and most importantly, we are here to end the stigma. There's going to be a wide range of speakers today and breakout sessions covering so many different topics. So I just ask today that you listen, you learn, and you really do pay attention because there are so many opportunities for us to gain some knowledge here and then leave and take it to someone else and tell one person about today. And I believe it, that as a community, we can come together and we can make big, big change. To kick off this event this morning, I would like to introduce the mayor of Hot Springs and president and CEO of Levi Hospital, Mayor Pat McCabe. Please give a round of applause. Thank you so much. Well, it's kind of hard to follow somebody whose job it is to be effervescent, bubbly, and smiley at, uh, for, with a morning show. So, uh, but I'll give it a whirl here. On behalf of the Board of Directors of the City of Hot Springs and our entire community, we certainly want to welcome you back uh, this year for, for the 2019 Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Summit. Um, we, uh, all communities across the country, you know, share in, in this, this challenge. Uh, as uh, Laura indicated, I'm the administrator, president of Levi Hospital, and we just uh, last night had our hospital board meeting where they approved our community health needs assessment plan. And one of the four top issues within our community dealt with substance abuse, which includes prescription drugs and vaping. And we are challenged as a community, both as an organization and as an entire community, to focus on ways of combating that. The fact that we have 12 or 1,300 participants here, not only in the state of Arkansas, but across the region, and I understand as far away as Idaho, uh, gives testimony to the fact that this issue is not a local issue, it's a national issue. And uh, when I give welcomes, I always like to grab the program and see what the topics are and who the intended audience is. And this issue has a huge tent. You know, when you look at the individual tracks, you have your law enforcement, you have your educators, you have your, your acute care providers, and then you have your recovery providers. That's a huge and awesome group of people that are all working together at different stages, but when you come together in a group like this, you're able to work together and find areas where, where you might be able to improve systems and improve coordination. So with that, I thank you. Um, I know this is a massive one-day meeting, and uh, you got a lot, to, a lot on your plate today. Uh, certainly, uh, the community of Hot Springs welcomes you, and if you have an opportunity to to hang around, we certainly uh, would enjoy and would provide you uh, great Southern hospitality. So with that, I'm gonna kick it back to Laura and uh, have a great conference. Thank you.
Our next speaker has been instrumental in fighting the opioid epidemic in our state, including suing drug distributors over their role in the epidemic and also educating the younger generations on this crisis. She's also the reason that we are here today. So please join me in welcoming Attorney General Leslie Rutledge. Well, good morning, everyone. All right, let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Fantastic. I see that we've got more Methodist and Baptist here than we have assemblies. So we're going to have to make a mental note to invite more folks from our, our front pew groups than our back pew. Well, what an enormous, fantastic crowd that we have today. Uh, for this 2019 Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Summit. Uh, I believe this is a record crowd. We have over 1,200, almost 1,300 people who will be attending today. Give yourselves a round of applause, absolutely. In addition to the great state of Arkansas, we have 14 states represented also. So Arkansas is a leader in this subject matter. The overwhelming response shows us two things. One, how prevalent prescription drug abuse remains in our communities. And then two, how interested we are as our Kansans and as a nation in solving this crisis and helping those affected by it. Today, you will hear from many amazing experts, speakers on the topics and I personally thank them, and we thank them, for taking time out of their busy schedules to be here with us. This annual summit is part of our multifaceted approach to addressing this crisis. In addition to the enforcement actions, we are going to continue to hold opioid manufacturers and distributors accountable. We also place a great deal of emphasis on education and treatment. I'm extremely proud of our education initiative, Prescription for Life. We have reached, in this academic year alone, almost 3,000 students. But we've got many more students to reach to make sure they understand the dangers of prescription drugs. Since we launched the program in 2017, we have implemented Prescription for Life in 145 schools and 73 of our 75 counties with 28 more schools already committed for this year. We have reached a total of almost 19,000 students since its inception. This program helps a generation overcome and avoid addiction. But this summit, these programs would not be possible without those of us in Arkansas working together. After all, Arkansas is just one big small town. And we work together across every single county, across government, because this epidemic doesn't care if you are black, white, Hispanic, it doesn't care if you are rich or poor, what neighborhood you live in, what neighborhood you grew up in. It's impacting all of us, moms, daughters, fathers, sons, everyone. And so I would like at this time to thank our partners and those who are helping put on today's summit, and particularly recognize, uh, beginning with our state drug director, Kirk Lane, and the Arkansas Office of the Drug Director. I, I saw Director Lane here in the front. Thank you, Director. <laughs> Dr. Cheryl May and the Criminal Justice Institute. Exe <laughs> Executive Director John Kirtley and the State Pharmacy Board. Special Agent Justin King and the Drug Enforcement Agency or Administration. The Arkansas Department of Health, the Arkansas Medical Board, the Arkansas State Board of Nursing, and University of Arkansas at Little Rock's Mid-South Center for Prevention and Training. 
Let's give them all a round of applause for their leadership in this area. And on a personal note, I would like to thank my incredible team at the Attorney General's Office for their diligent work every single year since this summit's inception. I believe back in 2011, maybe even 2012, uh, the team at the Attorney General's Office has been there every year, every step of the way. And under the leadership of Cindy Murphy. And so I want to say a special thank you today to Cindy Murphy, who is the Director of Public Affairs at the Attorney General's Office for all of her work on the Prescription Drug Summit, our Law Enforcement Summit, the Never Forgotten Summit, you name it summit, Cindy Murphy has been part of it. I am sad but excited to announce on Cindy's behalf that this will be her last summit officially with the Attorney General's Office. She has accepted a position at the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality to be the Chief of Staff, and I could not be more excited for Cindy, but more sad for all of our programs that she has led and been instrumental in. So thank you, Cindy, so much for all of your work on behalf of Arkansans. <laughs> Friends, the data tells us that we have won several battles in this area, but we have yet to win the war. That our efforts are not in vain. Prescribers are hearing our message, and we are consistently seeing a reduction in opioid prescription rates. But Arkansas, Arkansas still remains number two in prescribing rate in opioids in the country. But I can assure you that as long as I am the Attorney General and have a voice to be heard, that we will work on this issue. Whether it's the opioid crisis, taking too many lives, or perhaps now as we face the vaping epidemic with our young people, which is robbing an entire generation of their health. By God's grace and with your help, we are committed to saving lives one at a time. But if we want to see true transformation in our state, we have to continue our efforts just as we are today by combining enforcement, education, prevention, and rehabilitation. I know that you all join me in my commitment to make sure that by creating a better Arkansas for all of our kids. Another announcement to make today is our schedule has changed just a bit. Yesterday, the first official call I had of the day was with my good friend, the former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie. He sadly has come down with an illness that he caught while traveling, and Governor Christie will not be able to join us as our keynote speaker at the luncheon today. Uh, he offered to Skype in, but I said, you know, Governor, you're sounding pretty rough, friend, and I don't know that we all want to catch whatever you have via Skype. But he sends his regards. He was so impressed uh, that all we were doing, and he had looked forward to it. Uh, Governor Christie expressed to me that he was aware of all the programs that we were working on, all the actions that we had taken. He could not believe the number of attendees that we had, uh, that we were going to have in attendance today. And he was speaking not only as a former governor, someone personally committed to addressing this crisis, but also as part of, the, as part of President Trump's task force and chairman of that task force. And the president, a few months ago, I, I may have shared this with some of you all in the past, but a few months ago when I had the opportunity to be at the White House, and talking about the opioid epidemic, President Trump singled me out and said, Arkansas is a leader in the area of combating opioid abuse. And that's not to Leslie Rutledge. That message was to each and every one of you for what we are doing in this arena. So thank you from the president through me to you all. Thank you for your efforts of what you're doing to combat this crisis.
In Governor uh, Christie's place, we have a gentleman that is no stranger to some, but uh, he is name is Jerry C. Jones, and the C does not stand for Cowboys. It's a different Jerry Jones. Uh, Jerry is coming to this and will speak, be speaking to you not as a successful businessman, not as a data guru that he is, but rather as a dad and be sharing his story and how he has gone from devastated and mad to motivated. And I think that you will appreciate and learn from Jerry today at lunch. And so I express my sincere gratitude for Jerry answering the call yesterday and being willing to step in for today's luncheon. I know that you all will enjoy that. Again, thank you all for your leadership in this area. Thank you all for being committed to fellow Arkansans. Uh, as I look at my 16-month-old daughter every day and think about the challenges that she will face, that none of us thought we would be facing when we were growing up. None of us thought we would be facing prescription drug abuse as our number one prescription problem, our number one drug problem right behind illegal drugs like methamphetamine, which is wreaking havoc across our state. None of us thought we would be dealing with a vaping epidemic five years ago, much less 15 or 25 years ago. And so folks, thank you on behalf of a very grateful Attorney General and grateful state. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless the state of Arkansas. And as always, friends, God bless the United States of America. Let's have a great summit. Thank you. Thank you again to Attorney General Leslie Rutledge. And on a personal note, Le Leslie, I just have to thank you very much for um, inviting me to be here again this year and also for encouraging me to share my personal story. Um, you know, I kept that private for much, a very long time, and so I appreciate you encouraging me to be here today. Thank you so much for all you do. At this time, I would like to invite Shelly Short to the stage. Hi, Shelly. Shelly is the Vice President Programs and Partnership for the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce. Please join me in welcoming Shelly Short. Hi, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Are you doing good? <laughs> well, very good. Um, I want to thank you all for allowing me to be here today, and I want to offer my thanks to the Attorney General for giving us this opportunity and also to uh, Drug Director Lane for both of their leadership in this area and putting on forums like these to help educate and advocate for, um, for a drug-free Arkansas. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, the State Chamber of Commerce is um, a governmental affairs organization that, deals, that talks with employers on a regular basis. And one of the things that we hear from them quite often is that they have trouble finding a ready, drug-free workforce and that substance abuse is a problem, not just for them from a workforce standpoint, but because it affects their greatest asset, which is their employees. And we decided that after talking with Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield and AFMC, that we needed to put together a toolkit of resources to help employers provide solutions to their employees. We put together a group of modules called Together Arkansas. They're available free of charge on our website. And we hope that all of you will come by the Attorney General's booth today with us in creating a healthier drug-free workforce. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Randy Zook with the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce. For the past several years, we have been leading the conversation concerning Arkansas's workforce and the critical need to bolster the talent pipeline. But that's not the only reason Arkansas's employers are facing a shortage of available workers. The opioid epidemic in our state is affecting businesses of every kind, from small operations to larger corporations, creating daily challenges for employers and touching the lives of employees and their families. Each of those lives is a mother or father, child or friend, an employee with relationships in the workplace and community. More than ever, we're all challenged to find a ready, drug-free workforce 
and to help existing employees who are dealing with drug-related issues of their own or someone they care about. That's where we come in. The Arkansas State Chamber recognizes these issues and wants to offer solutions tailored to employers to help create an informed, drug-free workforce. After learning from a recent survey that 70% of HR managers reported their organization has been affected by prescription drugs, including absenteeism, decreased productivity, safety incidents, and even overdoses, we knew we needed to act. We've joined with Arkansas Blue Cross and Blue Shield and AFMC to create Together Arkansas, an initiative that raises awareness of this threat to your workforce and to arm you with a toolkit of resources that will help you as an employer prevent and manage the opioid problem. We're doing it because we all have the same mission, improving the lives, the health, the prosperity and potential of Arkansans from the Ozarks to the Delta and everywhere in between. Hi, I'm Ray Hanley, President and CEO of the Arkansas Foundation for Medical Care. At AFMC, our mission is to improve health care for Arkansans. We work with physicians and health care providers throughout the state, the very men and women who are on the front lines seeing the effects of the opioid use disorder. We've made significant strides in Arkansas to increase patient safety when it comes to opioids, but the problem is present still in every corner of our state and most of our workplaces. That's why we're working with the State Chamber and Arkansas Blue Cross to bring awareness to the issue in the workplace and to provide resources to help you be prepared to strengthen your employees. We hope the toolkit equips you with the skill set to better identify employees who might be struggling with the opioid use disorder, and you can use it to get them the help they need. We're in this together to improve the health of Arkansas's workforce. At Arkansas Blue Cross, we have a relationship with many of you and your companies. From the smallest startups to some of the largest employers in the state, we know that a healthy workforce is essential to strong business. The opioid epidemic is one of the biggest threats to the foundation of business in our economy today. Arkansas Blue Cross has been working with health care providers, educators, and organizations for several years to address opioid use in our state and invest in programs and treatments that impact this serious issue. So when Randy and the Arkansas State Chamber approached us to help equip Arkansas employers with an opioid toolkit, we were all in. As Arkansas employers, you're the backbone of our state, giving you tools to handle a problem as pervasive as opioid use disorder is critical. That's why we're here together to help create a drug-free workforce. Helping your employees break the bonds of addiction and get and stay healthy keeps them creative, innovative, and productive, and that makes Arkansas strong. I'm loud, but not that loud. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly. What an incredible initiative. I think it's, I heard a common thread in that, and that was we are in this together. It's going to take all of us. And it's so true, we turn a blind eye to it in the workplace, but that's where it's happening, whether you want to believe it or not. So thank you for this initiative. Although he could not physically be here today, Governor Asa Hutchinson has a special message for all of you to kick off the 8th Annual Prescription Drug Abuse Prevention Summit. So at this time, turn your attention to the screen for a special message from the governor. Hi, I'm Governor Asa Hutchinson. Education is the best weapon against the abuse of prescription drugs. I'm grateful to Attorney General Leslie Rutledge, Drug Director Kirk Lane, Pharmacy Board Executive Director John Kirtley, and Criminal Justice Institute Director Cheryl May for leading the charge to educate Arkansans. Nationally, 188 people die of a drug overdose every day. In 2018, 426 people in Arkansas died of an overdose. Nationally, the number of deaths by overdose has fallen by 3.3%, but in Arkansas, the number has increased by that percentage. That is why this summit is so important. Those of you here represent the wide range of professions that is necessary to fight this epidemic. Doctors, pharmacists, nurses, social workers, law enforcement officers, 
prevention and recovery specialists, and teachers. More than 40% of teenagers in Arkansas have tried prescription drugs, and more than half of all teens report that they can get prescription drugs from medicine cabinets in their own homes. In our state, we are fighting that with our twice a year drug take back day that allows Arkansans to dispose of old or unneeded medicine. When I was director of the Drug Enforcement Administration, I saw firsthand the devastation of drug abuse. Like you, I understand the urgency of this call to action to prevent the abuse of prescription drugs. Thank you for all your work to save lives. You can clap, I'm sure he, he's hearing you somewhere. Thank you so much, Governor Asa Hutchinson. So before we kick things off today, I'm going to invite up our first speaker as the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Arkansas, Dwayne Dak Keyes. Keyes was nominated by President Trump and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2017. He's previously spent more than eight years on active duty in the U.S. Army, deploying to both Afghanistan and Iraq, earning two bronze stars. Please join me in welcoming Dak Keyes. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank uh, Attorney General Leslie Rutledge for the invite. Um, I, I can truly tell you from a federal government perspective, this summit is extremely important. We see benefits from this summit. Um, when I was thinking about what to, to talk about here today, uh, the only advice I got was do not bore them. So I, I cannot promise you anything. But um, one of the things I want to talk about was over the last year, probably about a year and a half, uh, myself and my counterpart in the Eastern District, Cody Highland, we have basically put, uh, put uh, pill mills and uh, pharmacists that, that abuse their duties at the forefront of our, um, at our um, caseload. And as we begin to indict doctors, as we begin to indict pill mills and, and, and pharmacists or whatnot, the question that I get the most is not why you're doing it. The question I get the most is why are you choosing some of the charges when you're indicting these people? And it just dawned on me that that's, you have a right to know that. So I'd like to take some time here and just talk about some of the unusual ways that we, the federal government, is going after the opioid epidemic and try to explain to you why. It started about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago then, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions sent a memo out. He sent it out to all U.S. attorneys, and we called it the toolbox memo. And basically what he said was, he said, the opioid epidemic, and I'm going to sum it up for you, he says, it's gotten to the point now where I am instructing U.S. attorneys to use everything in your toolbox. Use everything in your toolbox to stop the prescription of these illegal opioids. And I tell you, the reason why that struck a chord is, is because prosecutors will tell you the first rule of prosecution is do not be inventive. Don't, don't try to use your imagination. Just go with the tried and true. And so we sat down and we really thought about that. And the, the tried and true, when you're, when you're talking about pill mills, it's a statute, it's 21 U.S.C. 841, and I don't care if anybody actually remembers that or not, but it basically says that when any person, when any person, um, when any person gives over um, an illegal, a controlled substance without a valid purpose, without a valid purpose. That's what we've been charging pill mill doctors for. That's what we, try, that's what we charge uh, drug dealers with, is that you are giving over an, a, a controlled substance and you don't have a valid purpose. The problem with that is, is that you have to look at it from, from the medical point of view, a valid purpose. That sometimes is very difficult to prove in court. Because a good portion of the time, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, a good portion of the time <clears throat> when a doctor determines whether or not to prescribe opioids, that doctor is relying in great part on what the patient is telling them. We've talked to doctors that will say, if we hire a brand new doctor into our clinic, 
for the first six months, that new doctor is going to receive patients from over 200 miles away because they're going to test the doctor. They know exactly what to say. They know exactly what terminology to use. They're testing the doctors. So patients will sometimes lie to doctors. And so it's very difficult always to charge that particular statute. So what we've done is we started thinking, all right, if the tried and true, if that statute is not going to work always, what should we do? Well, we started trying to be creative. And the first one that we looked at is what we call a thousand and one. You'll hear federal prosecutors talk about a thousand and one. All a thousand and one is, 18 U.S.C. a thousand and one, it's a false statement. You lied to the federal authorities. You either did it verbally during an interview, during an investigation, or you submitted some type of document to a federal agency and you lied on it. We've used that for pharmacists when they are constantly in communication with the DEA saying that they're in compliance, that they are keeping track of the, uh, of the drugs in their, in their pharmacy. When doctors, I believe every three years, uh, physicians have to uh, send in paperwork to the DEA in order to keep their prescription, uh, their prescription license or the ability to prescribe, they're always saying that, hey, we're doing this in compliance, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not breaking any of the laws. And we've gone back and looked and said, hey, if we can't prove that what happened in that, uh, in that room with that patient was an illegal drug distribution, maybe we can get the pill mill doctor by lying. And if we can, it's up to five years in prison. Up to five years in prison. If you go back and you look at indictments for doctors and for pharmacists across the nation, you're going to see 1,001. You're going to see 18 U.S.C. 1,001 because it's easy to prove. The second one that we're seeing, that we're using a lot, and I'm going to, second and third, I'm going to sum up together, is wire fraud and mail fraud. So how does wire fraud work with a pill mill? It's quite simple. There are certain doctors that are not running pill mills. They're not accepting cash. They have a normal uh, business, and what they're doing is, is that they are prescribing, they are prescribing opioids that they know to be illegal and they're still billing the insurance companies, okay? So wire fraud, I'm gonna define it for you. Wire fraud is a, is a scheme. It's a scheme to defraud somebody of their money and property, and in doing so, you used a wire, you, let, you used electronic means in interstate commerce. So once that doctor goes in and he submits a bill to the insurance company and he does it through email, at that moment in time, he has he or she has engaged in wire fraud. Just like that. Just like that. Wire fraud carries with it up to 20 years in prison. It's huge. Then there's mail fraud. Same thing. If a doctor is prescribing opioids that they know does not have a legitimate purpose, they know this person is addicted, they know this person may not be addicted, but they're going to go out and sell it. A diversion. They're going to go out and sell it, and they charge the insurance companies for it. If they mail any documentation or receive any documentation, they now have committed mail fraud. 20 years in prison. You're always going to see a mail or wire fraud when you look at a pill mail. The next one is money laundering. Money laundering. How can the feds figure out a way to get a pill mail or a dirty pharmacist for money laundering. Here it is. There's two types of money laundering. The first type prohibits an individual from engaging in financial transactions with the proceeds of a crime, okay? So that person cannot engage in a financial transaction with the proceeds of a crime. So here's what happens. You have a pill mill and they're accepting nothing but cash. They're accepting nothing but cash. So they take the several hundred dollars, maybe several thousand dollars that they've made that day, and then they go and put it in the bank. So now the bank is in receipt of proceeds from an illegal venture. The minute that doctor goes to an ATM, goes to Walmart, buys gas, and uses their debit card to pay for it, they've just completed a financial transaction with proceeds from an illegal venture. They've committed money laundering. 
Very easy. The second type of money laundering says the pro prohibits the spending in excess of $10,000 that's derived from an unlawful venture. All right? So notice, what's the difference between the two? Well, the first one, there has to be a banking transaction. That money has to find its way to a bank, and then you have to use the bank uh, in order to get that money out. The second one doesn't require a bank. It requires a financial transaction, but it doesn't require a bank. So again, you're operating a pill mill, you're taking several hundred dollars, maybe several thousand dollars a day in cash, you're putting it in your pocket, at the end of the day you're going to the bank and you're depositing it. You may not even have to deposit, but you save up that money and then you go buy a car. You save up that money and you go buy you know, a down payment on a house. You save up that money and you try to get your kid into USC. Um, well, that's, that's a joke, that's a joke. The minute you use, you take that illegal money and, you, and it adds up to over $10,000 and you spend it in some type of financial transaction, you've now committed money laundering. Money laundering is a little bit different because how much time you're going to do in jail depends on how much money you actually laundered. But it can go anywhere from five to 20 years. Five to 20 years. Once that pill mill doctor takes that money and puts it in a bank and then uses his debit card to fill up his tank, we got him for money laundering. The next one is quite easy, one of the easiest one, and that's tax fraud or tax evasion. And all that is is when a person willfully attempts to evade or defeat the taxes that are imposed on him. Okay, that's so easy. So what happens? That same pill mill doctor that's taking in thousands of dollars a day and putting it in their pocket, and they don't take it to a bank because they're wise about the money laundering. They don't use it in transactions over $10,000. They just keep it. They pay for their gas in cash. They pay for their groceries in cash. They do everything in cash. Well, guess what? They're probably not reporting that money on their taxes. And I gotta tell you something about the IRS. If you look closely at your tax forms, you have a duty not only, you have a duty not only to account for your legal proceeds, there's a little box on there where you have to account for illegal proceeds too. Honest to God, I'm not lying. And so when they do not account for those illegal proceeds, we have them on tax evasion. That carries with it a five year sentence. So as you can see, there is a lot of ways, creative ways that we are going after, that we're trying to defeat this opioid crisis without ever charging doctors with actually giving over illegal drugs. We're trying to be creative. Now, what I talked to you about was just the criminal side of the house. We're going to use, I'm a whistleblower, I know my boss is overbilling TRICARE, or I know that this doctor over here is overbilling Medicare. If you know that, then it's called a KETAM, and I'm not going to tell you the Latin version of what that means, but it basically, basically says that, hey, I'm doing the government's job for them. If you come to us and say, hey, I know this, then if we sue using the False Claims Act and we are able to recoup the losses, you are entitled to a percentage of those losses, up to 15 to 25 percent. Let me tell you something, plaintiff's lawyers love this. I get a call about every week saying, hey, I've got a good KETAM case. And I'm, I'm like, you can't even spell it. But anyway, <laughs> but there are civil remedies that we can go after. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about was, and this is forfeiture. And you may have heard this before, forfeiture. And there's two types of forfeiture. There's criminal and civil forfeiture. And this is probably when it, this is probably one of the more, I don't, this is the longest arm that the federal government has to reach out in the opioid crisis. And so let me talk about criminal forfeiture. When the criminal case is over with, and hopefully we got a conviction, if we got a conviction, we can then immediately, it happens and the, the jury comes back and says guilty, the jury is dismissed for the day, and the federal prosecutor will stand up and say, Your Honor, we have a forfeiture action we'd like to discuss. And the judge says, all right, Talk to me, what do you have? And we can say, Your Honor, during the course of this trial, we believe that the federal government has proven that certain assets owned by the defendant were, were uh, obtained from, by the defendant through illegal proceeds. 
either the defendant was able to get this property because of a, uh, a, a drug transaction or the proceeds of a drug transaction allowed him to buy this car or to buy this house. If we can prove that by a preponderance of the evidence through the criminal trial, the judge says, all right, federal prosecutor, you're right. I'm going to declare that those items be forfeited. And so we get to take, we get to take those items for the benefit of the federal government, okay? Think about that. Think about if you're running a pill mill or you're a pharmacist that is abusing their duties, all the money that you're getting from your illegal venture, where is that money going? Is it paying off your house? Is it buying cars? Is it buying jewelry for your spouse? Is it buying a bigger clinic? All of those things, the federal government at the end of a criminal trial can come in and take. We can take it. Now, that's criminal forfeiture. Then there's civil forfeiture. I don't need a criminal trial for civil forfeiture. If I can't prove that a doctor is running a pill mill, or if I can't prove that a pharmacist is dirty, if I can't prove that in a criminal trial, I can, because we know criminal trials are um, beyond a reasonable doubt, civil trials are preponderance of the evidence, I can then sue them. And the great thing about suing them is in a criminal trial, when I go after criminal forfeiture, I can only go after that which the defendant owns. The defendant has to own the property before I can take it. But in a civil forfeiture, I get to go after the property, and I don't care who owns it. I don't care who owns it. So that brand new car that he brought his, you know, that he bought his brother and gave to him, I can go after the car. If he buys somebody a, um, you know, if he buys his father-in-law a nice Rolex, I can go after the Rolex. It doesn't matter who owns the property. The only thing that the federal government has to prove is that the person who now owns the property knew or should have known that that property was purchased with proceeds from an illegal venture. And I guarantee you, just trust me on this, there are few things that are just hard and fast under the law. And one of them is the spouse always knows. The spouse always knows. And so we go after and we take jewelry, we take cars, we take a lot of things through civil forfeiture. And so these are just some of, these are just some of the inventive ways that we are using, we meaning federal prosecutors are using to combat the opioid crisis. And again, the reason why I bring these up is not to tell our trade craft or not to tell any of our secrets. It's because you have a right to know you have a right to know what your representatives in federal courts are doing. You have a right to know why when you see a doctor who is being charged for running a pill mill, when you find out what the charges are, you never see the distribution of an illegal substance. You see wire fraud, you see mail fraud, you see tax evasion. You have a right to know. And I want you to know, we, meaning U.S. attorneys, are never going to stop being inventive when it comes to the opioid crisis. We're never going to stop trying to think outside the box. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. And secondly, you deserve it. You deserve it. Everyone has, everyone has an opioid story. Either someone in their family or a loved one, somebody they worked with, everyone has an opioid story. And I hear them all the time and they're devastating. They're devastating. And that's what drives us. That's what drives the men and women of federal law enforcement to think outside the box. It's not because we love what we do. We do love it. It's because we don't want to hear any more stories. We don't want to hear any more stories. And I pray for the day that the stories stop. But until then, we will continue to think outside the box. So again, I want to thank you for the invite. Thank you for being here today. And um, I appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Q-U-I-T.
T-A-M. Did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> I cheated. I looked it up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doc. We appreciate you and everything you had to say today. At this time, we're gonna keep things rolling. Okay, we're going quick here. Everybody is gonna head to their breakout sessions. If you are not sure where that is, if you just open your folder right there on that second page, you can find all the information. I know you're all wondering about lunch. Be back in this room at 12 and we will feed you. Good, 12 o'clock. Enjoy your sessions. Thank you, everybody.
Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear? Can't hear. I'll just be loud. Hello. Not yet? I got the thumbs up. We're good. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank, oh, thank you in the back. I heard you. All right, if everyone can make their way in, you all can eat, and we are going to start with our lunchtime presentation. Um, for some housekeeping, if you lost a phone, there was a phone left in the women's bathroom. It's an iPhone, so like 99.9% .9 of you here. Um, check your pockets and your purses. There is a phone, and I believe it's at the very front where you registered. I see everyone checking their pockets. So if that is you, go grab your phone. It's there at the front. It was left in the women's restroom. As you heard the Attorney General mention, unfortunately, former Governor Chris Christie could not be here today, but he did send a letter, and I have verified it does have his signature on it. So I'm going to read this to you. Dear General Rutledge, first, my apologies for not being able to join you today. Unfortunately, I caught a vicious cold slash flu on Monday evening and could not travel to be with you today. I hope to be able to join you again in the near future. Your meeting today addresses the biggest public health crisis this nation has seen since the HIV AIDS crisis. Tens of thousands of Americans are dying every year from opioid addiction. More than deaths from auto accidents and gun violence combined. We have to address the three legs of this stool towards recovery, interdiction, treatment, and non-opioid alternatives for pain. As chairman of the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis, we put forward 63 recommendations to deal with this challenge. All 63 recommendations were adopted by the President, and I truly believe they represent the blueprint for effectively addressing ending this crisis. I am confident with Attorney General Rutledge's leadership and with your help, Arkansas will help to lead the way. While I cannot be with you in person today, I am with you in spirit to help the people we are fortunate enough to serve. All the best, Chris Christie. I was going to do my best Chris Christie impersonation, but I'll just let the letter speak for itself. <laughs> you know, when I stood on this stage a year ago, I shared a story with you that many of you have told me you remember. It was October 30th, 2018, two days before I was set to speak here at the summit. I was in my car and I came to the intersection of Sam Peck and Cantrell in Little Rock when a woman a few cars ahead of me overdosed right in the front seat. I called 911 immediately and told them we needed Narcan, an opioid overdose antidote. And it took several minutes, but the police arrived and they were finally able to administer the Narcan. And she immediately woke up. But I left that day and I left not knowing what happened to her. I didn't know if she went to jail or she went to the hospital. I didn't know if she left the scene and overdosed again. And that's where the story ended, or so I thought. But as many of you know, God works in mysterious ways. Thanks to a post I made on Facebook, the young woman and I connected a few weeks later. She, but I knew that she wanted to walk a different path. But I know from experience, as I know many of you do too, Someone has to want recovery. You can't force it on them. So I waited and I listened. And in early January, two months after we met, the young woman finally agreed to get some help. Thanks to some incredible people in this room, including my best friend forever, State Drug Director Kirk Lane, we were able to get her into a treatment center in Arkansas. Unfortunately, shortly after she got out, she relapsed and she found herself in trouble. And if you know addiction, you know that happens far too often. We did not give up on her though. She entered rehab again and she is living a life of recovery. It was our plan for her to be here today, but unfortunately she's not able to attend. 
Her drug use and her relapse cost her, and right now she is serving time. But the most important part is she is sober. She's living a life of recovery, and she has a future, all because people did not give up on her. I get emotional talking about this, and I didn't plan to, but this woman has become so important to me, and I believe that she truly, her life is a snapshot into so many people who are struggling with addiction. I cannot even begin to imagine, imagine what it's like to battle this demon, but I do know the incredible pain of losing someone that you love to this disease. Four years ago, I lost the love of my life to a heroin overdose. Brock was 27 years old. He was the man I intended to marry. And instead, I go to sleep each night with his ashes on my nightstand. Brock was called home. This woman was given a second chance. I could be angry, and I could ask why, but instead, I chose to share this story with you, and I choose to every day, to show those who do not understand that there is hope, that it may take two or three or four or 10 times but we cannot give up on those who are in this fight. State Drug Director Kirk Lane, thank you. State Drug Director Kirk Lane says it perfectly. This is not a you problem or a me problem. It is a community problem. And it is going to take us coming together as a community if we are going to solve it, just like we are today. I do my part in traveling the state and sharing Brock's story. At THV 11, we started an initiative, as many of you know, it's called Saving a Generation. It began with a documentary and it has evolved into so much more. Every day we are highlighting the opioid abuse problem in our state, but the important thing is we are also sharing hope, the stories of people in recovery. Not many people know this, but when I came up with that name, Saving a Generation, it was because of a DEA agent said that to me. If we don't do something, we are going to lose a generation. Originally, the title was Losing a Generation, but it was my news director that said, let's, let's shed some positive light on this. We could talk about the problem all day long, but we have to share some hope, and that's where the saving came in. Since that October day, I also carry Narcan with me everywhere I go. That small device fits right there in my purse and I take it with me everywhere. It can save someone's life in an instant. I also educate people on how to use it. It's as simple as going to your local pharmacy and asking for it. No prescription needed. I've even changed my vocabulary. No longer do I use words like drug addict or dirty. Instead, I say a person with a substance abuse problem or substance free. The words that we use matter so much. We can reduce the stigma simply by changing our language. Another thing I felt called to do was start a support group. If you know grief, you know you can feel very alone, especially when you lose someone to substance abuse. I attended a grief group at a local church and it was helpful, but I felt so afraid to share about my loss because of the way that Brock died. And I never wanted anyone to feel the way that I did. Shortly after his death, a friend introduced me to an online Facebook group and it's called GRASP, G-R-A-S-P, which stands for Grief Recovery After Substance Passing. The group is private. When I joined, there were 3,000 members. That was back in 2015. Today, there's over 10,000. It's only for those who have lost someone to substance abuse. I found solace in this group and I felt like I could finally open up to these people even though it was through a screen. And even though we were strangers, it felt so familiar because everyone understood what it was like to lose someone the way that I had. And several grass chapters also meet all over the country. But when I looked, there was not a single one in Arkansas. So I prayed about it. I hope someone will start one here. Please, please someone start a chapter locally. I prayed and I prayed until I heard God's whisper and I knew that I was meant to start one. So I did. 
In April of 2019, I, alongside my friend Tamara Deaver, held the first grass meeting in Arkansas. The group is small, but sadly, I know it will grow. It is a safe haven. It is a place, a private place, where those who know the loss and pain of addiction can grieve together and not fear judgment. If you want any information on GRASP, grasphelp.org, G-R-A-S-P-H-E-L-P.org, or come talk to me and I'd ha be happy to introduce you to a group. That's my part. That's my role. So I ask you, what's yours? How will you step up and become part of this fight? It doesn't have to be anything drastic. If you're afraid of public speaking, you do not have to get up on a podium. But you can start by educating yourself. Learn about the disease of addiction. Talk to people in recovery. They love to talk, right guys? There are plenty of people here today that I would love to introduce you to. Attend an open NA or AA meeting. Learn about Narcan. Get some yourself. Stop the judgment. Stigma is by far the biggest barrier preventing people from seeking recovery. Changing the stigma will benefit everyone. It will help people to regain self-esteem. It will help lawmakers to appropriate funding allow doctors to treat without disapproval from their peers, allow insurers to cover treatment, and most importantly, help the public understand that this is a medical condition as real as any other. Choosing the words we use more carefully is one way we can all make a difference and help decrease the stigma. And I think most importantly is having a little bit more compassion. Forget that, a lot more compassion. This could be your son, your daughter, your best friend, the love of your life, what would you say then? Compassion means to suffer together. Without compassion for others, it is so difficult to do the deep work of recovery. We have to have a willing, willingness to face this issue together, to lean into places that hurt in order to overcome the pain that is at the root of addiction. And the best part, compassion costs nothing. So today I ask that you listen, ask questions, be engaged, and ask yourself, what role can I play in all of this? Remember, it is going to take all of us to win this fight. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite our keynote speaker up to this stage and Attorney General Leslie Rutledge to talk to you a little bit about Jerry Jones. We have the real Jerry Jones in, in um, I was gonna say in the studio, today here in Hot Springs. And I had a chance to talk to Jerry a little bit. I'll tell you what, he's got an amazing bio. It's very long, I'm not gonna read it. Uh, but I will tell you, he is the Chief Legal and Ethics Officer and Executive Vice President of LiveRamp. He has many, many accolades, but he's here today for a different reason, and I'm gonna allow him to share that. And I, I had a few brief moments to speak with him a little bit before, and I promise what he has to say is an engaging, engaging speech, and you will want to listen. So will the real Jerry Jones please stand up? <laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon. Um, and We're in TV here. Oh. <laughs> Come here. There you go. Can I hide that in your pocket? Yeah, sure. All right. Just, That's what they're made for. Okay. <laughs> All right. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> here we go. Um, Laura, thank you for that kind introduction, and most importantly, thank you for sharing some of your life experiences with us um, about what you're doing. Um, and I also want to thank KTHV for the series that you ran on saving a generation. Uh, that was a substantial commitment by that company to try to raise awareness and to make a difference. And it's very appreciated. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today. And 
You know, earlier this morning, as I often do, I was talking with my mom um, about what I was going to do today. She's 96 years old. She likes to hear from her son. And when I told her that I was going to be filling in for a former Republican governor, Chris Christie, <laughs> if you know my mom, you know what she said. Well, Jerry, that doesn't mean that you're become a Republican today, does it? And I said, no, Mom, don't worry. Um, I'm not. And I'm not even going to be talking about politics. And I'm most certainly not going into politics today, so don't worry about it. But what I did say was that Governor Christie and I share a lot of common ground and that the fight against the opiate epidemic is one that crosses all boundaries and all versions of political persuasion. And why is that? Well, this beast, this beast of the disease of opiate addiction in America knows no political dividing lines. It knows no social or economic dividing lines, and it knows no geographic boundaries to contain itself. It's everywhere. And so there's a lot of common ground on what we should be doing about this. And I really admire Governor Christie for the leadership that he has shown, for the passion that he has shown around these issues, for his leadership with the Presidential Commission, and most importantly, for carrying on with what needs to be done every single day. And I wish that he was here today to share his views directly with us. They're very insightful and very thoughtful. So in our time together today, um, allow me to share with you a journey of, of our family, and one that many of you have also taken. And if you haven't taken it yourself, you're very familiar with the journey. And I want to share with you also about what we have been doing um, after the tragic consequences of part of that journey to try to make things better for people. And I want to leave you with a few suggestions on a couple of things that we can do and we can get done to move forward and to add to the common ground that we can build upon to encircle this epidemic and push it back where it belongs. You know, all of you know that every day across our country, almost 200 people die from opiate addiction. And like many of you, 1,363 days ago, my family lost a loved one to this disease. We lost our youngest son, Barrett, nicknamed B. B was 28. He was a graduate of Catholic High School for Boys in Little Rock. He was a former church league basketball star. As a parent, I can say that with pride. Um, he was an outstanding state-ranked tennis player. He's a whiz at video games. He's a natural entrepreneur. When he was in grade school, he figured out how to beat video games and started selling cheat codes to his friends. And when his friends would get in trouble, he would record TV shows and sell them the, the VHS tapes. Um, and he was bright enough that I later found out that he wrote term papers for some of his friends in college for classes that Barrett never, ever took. Um, he was gifted, and he had a lot of advantages, and he was loved by lots and lots of people. Most importantly, his big brother, his mom and his dad, and a close group of friends. But somehow this beast of a disease found him, and he became dependent upon it. And in the end, he decided that his journey of his life had come to an end but he didn't die of an accidental overdose, but he consciously ended his life, at least in part, because he could no longer have opiates in his body. He had tried to quit, and through an amazing force of sheer will and mind effort, he had actually been off opiates for a while. But something happened in his body and his mind coupled with the effects of the lasting effects of addiction, seized the opportunity 
conspired against him, and so he ended his life. By the way, you know, 45% of all people believe that, quote, all that is needed to overcome addiction is just willpower. But we know the evidence doesn't support that and is directly to the contrary. Many times B had said that he so wished that he could just return to normal, that he could just feel normal again. My, oh my, how he wanted that. But opiates were the closest thing that brought him back to feeling normal. Their hold, the changes and the disease that they brought to him changed him and they were too strong for him to overcome. He was an adult at this point in his life and as his parents, we couldn't force him to seek treatment that we knew was available other than through our expressions of support and love and economics. But he just wouldn't seek treatment on his own. He thought that he could will his way away from the disease. So Judy, my wife and I faced some hard choices. Do we continue to provide him money that we well knew that he was going to use to buy opiates on the black market? Or do we financially cut him off and see him living under a bridge someday? Hard choices. No parent ever wants to be faced with those choices. We made the choice to support him for a very long time. Our strategy was that every day that Barrett was alive was a day when something good could happen and that we wanted to get him to the next day. Perhaps the other choice works better for some, but that's not the choice that we made. One of the things that we learned from Barrett was the danger of being overly judgmental and that we had to take him on his own terms. On the last night of his life, he came home. He came home. And we talked of love and many things. When we said goodnight that evening, I had no idea what was about to happen. I had no idea that that would be the very last time that we would have the blessing of being able to be together and talking with each other. Looking back, of course there were hints that with the benefit of hindsight should have been better clues as to what he was contemplating. But those hints were only revealed with the benefit of hindsight. The next morning, we found him. And in an act of kindness and compassion, he had ended his life in a manner and in a place that told us that he was at peace with his decision and that we need not worry about where he was. He knew that we would find him quickly, and we did. Called 911, and within 10 minutes, the police department, the Little Rock Fire Department, EMTs showed up at the house. Detectives showed up. Uh, the coroner showed up. Things were a blur. There was yellow tape around our front yard. And they all very professionally did their jobs. And then they were gone. The yellow tape was removed. And from outward appearances, nothing had changed. But everything had changed in our lives at that point. That morning, I was struck by how rapidly our systems had kicked in when that one phone call was made. And I began to wonder why we can't design our systems to be as easily accessible for the people that need help as the systems that kick in that are there to deal with the tragic outcomes that sometimes occur from opiate addiction. The pain. The reality of loss was devastating. It was overwhelming. Many of you know what I mean when I say that to this day, there are times when we just fall to our knees. But we had to move forward. 
And over the next several days, thoughts began to form. Judy and I knew, and our son Grant knew what had happened, but the question of why did this happen was a question that we knew would be unanswerable, as there are so many different things that can impact a person's life that trying to find an accurate answer to the question of why was something that would drive us nuts. And so we decided not to deal with the why, but to deal with the future and what could we do. In addition to the pain of the loss, what I felt was failure. Failure as a parent. Um, we hadn't been able to save our son. Can't think of a bigger failure than that. And by the way, there's a McKinsey study that shows that a third of the people in our country think that addiction is caused by either a character flaw or bad parenting. I don't think it is. The evidence certainly doesn't show that. But I still felt like I had failed Barrett, and I had to do something about this. And of course, everyone deals with a loss like this in your own way and should be respected. And obviously, there's no playbook on how to deal with this. But Judy and I decided out of this very dark time that we had to do our best to try to create some light and find ways to honor the life of B. First and foremost, we were going to keep him alive in our hearts and minds. He wasn't going anywhere. Love is eternal, and he would always be with us. But to find that light, we had to make things better for others. We had to work to raise awareness around the causes of addiction and awareness of valid treatments for addiction and to educate and drive the change. So rather than writing a check, which is needed, but not nearly enough. We thought the better path was to activate our network of friends and colleagues that we had met, met along our lives around what needed to be done. President Clinton has been a very close friend of mine since I was 17 years old and he was 27 in 1973. And I knew that he would call within a day of Barrett's passing, and he did. Somehow, some way, he was gonna find out. And he was comforting in his words. And he also said that he would help any way that he could and that we just needed to know what to do. So not long after his death, about a month later, he and I had a long breakfast one morning and he shared with me that our family was the fifth family First, we need to help them change their coverage philosophies and provide coverage for addiction and mental health. And to treat, as Laura said, to treat addiction as a disease and not an issue of morality. You know, insurance covers disease and injury. It doesn't cover morality. So if people think that addiction is a moral issue, it doesn't give a lot of incentive to the health insurance company. And if we could get the insurance companies to cover mental health and addiction, then the Federal Health Parity Act kicks in, which means that if an insurance, basically it means that if a health insurance policy covers one disease, it's got to cover other diseases in a similar manner. And a lot of policies will have a 30-day limitation on treatment for drug abuse. Well, not very many people can cure cancer in 30 days, and you can't really effectively deal with addiction in 30 days either, so that needed to be changed. And second, we needed them to remove the pre-approval process so that when someone who suffers from this disease goes, finds a way to seek medical treatment, they're not told that, well, we could help you, but you've got to come back in three or four days after we get the approval from your insurance company so that we can get paid for this. And you know what? We've made a lot of progress on this. Some of the major insurance companies in America have changed their policies and their views on this. On the legislative front, one thing that we saw that needed to be changed was we needed to flip 
when information is reported to the prescription drug management program in Arkansas. We already had the basic infrastructure in place, but we needed to flip it so that before a prescriber could validly write the prescription or have it filled for a narcotic, they had to check a statewide database. Good people will share with me their experiences of themselves or their sister, their brother, their mother, their aunt, their uncle, their grandmother, their granddad, their friend, their neighbor, who have been negatively impacted by this disease. Just yesterday, about 30 minutes after Attorney General Rutledge called me and asked me if I could fill in for the governor, a business associate asked me what I was going to be doing today, and I told him. He said, well, allow me to share my story. And he had lost his little brother to an opiate um, overdose last year at Christmas. It's everywhere. So we know that we need to change the narrative. We know we need to change the words that we use. And we know that we need to change how we speak to people who have an addiction. And we know that we needed to help people understand that having an addiction is not the full definition of that person, that there's so much more to that person's life than to simply put them in the category of, well, he or she's an addict. They're an addict. They're kind of discarded. They're a person, and they have basic human rights, and we need to pretty close to Doug for a couple of years, but had left Walmart. And Doug came up to me and said, Jerry, how you doing, man? And I said, well, do you really want to know? And he said, oh, I guess I do. And I told him the story of our family's journey with Barrett. And he said, what can Walmart do? I kind of thought he was being nice, but Doug's a serious guy. And the next morning over coffee, he found me and said, look, I was up most of the night last night. I'm dead serious. I thought about your family last night, and I want to know, what can Walmart do? Tell me. Okay. So I called the friends at the Clinton Health Matters Initiative and said, look, we got a green light here to go to the largest employer of people in America. They have well over a million people that work for them. One percent of the U.S. workforce works for Walmart. They're the third largest owner of pharmacies. They have power. We got to walk back through that door and help them do some things. So we put together a 15-page outline, sent it up to Doug on uh, the next Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. At 6 o'clock that night, he emails me back and says, I got it. I read it. It's what I wanted. It's what I needed. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it to the head of public policy and our head of medicine. They will be in touch. Three days later, they were. Soon, we were together in a conference room in their world headquarters going through an outline of what could that company do. Could they do this? Could they do that? Trying to find a fit for things that they could do. They made a commitment. What did they do? They said, we're going to throw some technology at this. We're going to start doing a better job of monitoring the prescription amounts and links in our pharmacies. And if we detect that doctors are over-prescribing, we're going to cut them off. The risk department said, we're going to get sued. General counsel said, bring it. I'm so proud of that homegrown organization with that attitude where they were willing to take risk to do the right thing. And they did a number of other things. They increased the, the uh, informational materials that you get when you fulfill a prescription in, in their pharmacies. They upgraded the education of their pharmacists. They worked with another company to make available a substance that you could put in a pill bottle that still had some unused pills in it, put some water in it, turns it into a brick so that it can't really be used or stolen or taken out of somebody's medicine cabinet by a teenager or a babysitter or a friend. And they did some good things. So we've done a few things to bring light, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And it's not just one thing. There are no silver bullets here. But if we can get a 1% or 2% improvement from doing something here and 5% here and 5% here and 5% here, pretty soon we've kind of circled the problem and we can make a lot of progress. So I have five specific suggestions that I'd like to leave with you today for your consideration. 
First is what I've already referred to. As you do your work and as you work within the systems, think about how you can make your systems more accessible to people that need your help. Create an easy button mentality and try to design your systems from the individual's perspective back towards your entity as opposed to the other direction. It's a change of mindset. We have to make our help systems easier to access. We need laws that absolutely require health insurers that do business in Arkansas to provide adequate coverage for mental health and drug abuse issues. Um, there's a model bill on the Shatterproof website on this. I'd really like everybody in this room to take a look at that bill and let's put together an effort to drive this change and get our legislature to do that. We can do that and that will make a huge improvement on the availability of being able to support so many of the people in this room with additional insurance coverages so that you can fulfill the missions that you're committed to. Third, we need to find ways to support more scientific research on the causes and the treatments for addiction and the preventive measures that could take in place. You know, humanity has yet to invent or discover everything that we're ever going to discover. And one of the great things about the progress of humanity is we keep discovering things as we move forward. So what am I talking about? There is some exceptionally promising research on the possibility of developing a vaccine that utilizes the body's antibodies to attack the small molecules in opiates that are responsible primarily for the addiction. We brought the leading scientist on this to the conference that I mentioned at the Clinton Center a couple of years ago, Dr. Jana at Scripps Institute. Um, it's some amazing research. The efficacy has already been proven in mice and rhesus monkeys. So we know it works in primates. And very importantly, the uh, director of the National Institutes of Health, National Institute of Health, has written about this and says this is very, very promising research and needs to be part of the national strategies. Fourth, and this is kind of a hard one, we need to find a way for those who love and care for someone who is afflicted with the disease of addiction, but is an adult and is resistant to treatment, to have a way for their loved ones to access the judicial system in appropriate circumstances, to be able to force, yes, force that person into treatment. Right now, you can do it for three days. Three days doesn't get you anywhere. We've got to get real about this. And yes, um, that infringes on the rights of the person who has that disease, but yes, it will save a lot of lives. And I think that we need to re-tip the balance in favor of saving lives and improving lives and helping people live a better life. Likewise, we need to readjust the balance point on privacy rights under HIPAA. As a parent of an adult child, we really couldn't make very many appointments with medical professionals for our child who, for one reason or another, was incapable of doing that himself. And that was a step that needed to be helped. And frankly, very few people die from an invasion of privacy. Let's be real about this. But a lot of people die when they don't get treatment. So let's take a look at balancing those respective interests and work towards changing that federal law. I'm betting that most of us in this room would make that trade. So I know that I've gone on a bit too long, but this is important stuff. It matters. And by no means do I seek personal credit for me or my family for any of the things that I've spoken of. But rather, I'm willing to speak of them as a parent, 
as a senior executive in a public company and as an Arkansan, as just a possible inspiration to others to be willing to do what you can and to help others come into the light and be willing to destigmatize this disease and talk about it. One final comment on things that Judy and I do on the personal front, and it's part of the ongoing process of dealing with the loss of Barrett and keeping him alive in our hearts. Each year around his birthday, um, we invite six of his very good friends over to the house for dinner. Judy cooks a mean beef tenderloin, um, and so all of these young men had stayed true to Barrett, and they had tried to help him in any way they could. Tyler, Joe, Teddy, Jordan, Ryan, and Brad. And we sit around and we reminisce, drink a little wine, tell some fun stories about Barrett. That's how I found that he wrote term papers for some of them, but I'm not going to say who. Um, and we bring him back to life by doing that. And we get to share with everyone where our lives have taken us. So I'm so very grateful for the work that every single person in this room is doing on these issues. You could have made other choices with your lives. You could have had other careers. You could be doing other things. You could be other places today. But you care. And the work that you're doing matters. You're making things better for people. You're helping them live a, a life. And in addition to helping them live a life, you're helping them find ways to be, to have a happier and healthier and more productive life. So thank you very much for the opportunity and for the grace of putting up with listening to me today. Um, and feel free to call upon me if you think I can help in any way possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jerry, not only for answering that call 26 hours ago from the Attorney General, but for also finding purpose in your pain and sharing with us today. Thank you so very much. We have a brief break. The next session starts at 1.15. So y'all full? You get everyone good? Everyone good? Y'all can head out that way. There are some booths that you can check out and the next batch of session starts at 1.15. If you have any questions, there are two lovely ladies sitting up there at the help desk. Uh, before you all run away, wait, 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 wait. Thank you, I saw everyone sit back down. I wanna take a selfie with everyone. So if y'all could smile. Oh, that, I see that guy's gonna be in the picture. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Great job. <laughs> Thanks. All right, y'all are dismissed. Hello. Oh, it is working. Okay, good. I was getting a little nervous. So, good afternoon. My name is Darren Dahlum. I am Miss Arkansas 2019, and I'm so excited to be here to get to introduce your speakers. Well, thank you. So, it might seem a little interesting, or at least a little different, that Miss Arkansas would be here at a Prescription Drug Abuse Summit. However, Every year, Miss Arkansas has a purpose that she likes to champion. And for the last five years, I have been championing underage drinking and drug abuse prevention. Um, the reason why is I've got many friends and family members who I've seen personally struggle with this, specifically my older sister. Um, at the age of 16, I watched her begin a drug and alcohol addiction that continues to this day. She has been sent to rehab two times and checked herself out both because neither were state mandated. Um, she has recently suffered another arrest, and what we've seen in this whole situation is that there would always be a trade-off. 
So she would start with alcohol, and then when alcohol wasn't enough, she would turn to prescription pills, sometimes sleep aids and sometimes opioids, depending on what she was able to get her hands on. Um, after her last arrest, she has now had a breathalyzer be added into her car, and therefore alcohol will no longer work for her to get it throughout the day, and so she's turned back to prescription drugs. So there are ways that these people are able to find a way around, specifically the rules that we put in place to try and save them and help them. And there's a real lack of empathy and also a lack of curriculum when it comes to our children. I know that drugs are sometimes something that we don't want to talk about with our children because this is what they get exposed to. So if we talk about it, then they're going to know what it is. They're going to know what they do, how they can help them. And at the end of the day, it's that gap that we leave open for them to be able to find that information on the internet or worse, find it from a friend who tells them that it's not going to happen to them and that addiction can't start with one person. Knowing that I have a genetic tendency that gives me a 40 to 60% heightened risk to be addicted to substances is the only reason that keeps me from being able to use pain pills whenever I've had surgeries on my eyes in the last uh, couple years. It's understanding that we have genetic tendencies and it's understanding that everyone might have them that they might not be aware of, but also that our children are incredibly at risk in today's age and society. And so that's why even though Miss Arkansas and the Miss America organization is a far cry from, from a, drug, a prescription drug summit, that's why I'm here today. And that's why I'm so thankful to be able to have each and every one of you here with me as we are able to champion this cause to hopefully be able to cause a difference and a ripple effect in our youth. And so without further ado, I will introduce our next two speakers. The first being Jim Gearhart. He has 31 years of, di of service and diverse law enforcement experience with the Thornton Police Department in Colorado. In 1992, he was assigned to the North Metro Task Force as an undercover drug investigator for the Adams County area, where he has developed his personal area of expertise in drug enforcement and child maltreatment. He was promote, promoted to sergeant in 1996 and eventually returned to the North Metro Task Force where he supervised undercover drug investigations for the expanded area of Adams and Broomfield counties from 1999 to 2005 and again from 2008 to 2017. He served as the legislative liaison and the state vice president for the Cal Colorado Drug Investigators Association and has been a contract instructor for CGI's Drug Endangered Children program since 2005. And our second speaker will be Dr. Cheryl May. Dr. Cheryl P. May is the director of the Criminal Justice Institute and its National Center for Rural Law Enforcement and the Arkansas Center for School Safety. She has served as an advocate for the Arkansas law enforcement community for 35 years as a forensic professional and also as a CGI chief executive officer, CGI deputy director, CGI assistant director, and CGI program manager. Dr. May earned a PhD in biological and forensic anthropology at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in 1984. She has also earned a MA in Biological Anthropology from Western Michigan University in 1982 and a BA in Anthropology from West Virginia University in 1978. Dr. May is the principal investigator on three CGI grants. Oh my goodness, I'm gonna mess this up. So I'm just gonna say the letters. S-A-M-H-S-A, -S -A, Arkansas Division of Aging, Adult and Behavioral Health Services, and Blue and You Foundation for a Healthier Arkansas, focusing on one, naloxone administration, training, and Narcan distribution for first responders and families in recovery, and two, providing communities and prevention education resources to reduce the number of opioid overdose deaths in Arkansas. So without further ado, here are your speakers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay? Great, awesome. Thank you all uh, for staying after lunch. Uh, but most importantly, uh, thank you for what you do each and every day. Uh, CJI has been one of the key partners of this summit ever since the beginning. So I've had the personal uh, privilege of being able to be involved in every single summit. But I do wanna thank uh, all the key summit partners uh, for their dedication to making this very important uh, opioid summit happen. You know, we have tremendous leadership in our state, and uh, every year we collaborate for the benefit of communities across our state. I do want to give a special shout out uh, to General Rutledge, 
uh, and in particular two key staff members of hers. She mentioned Cindy Murphy, and we're very, very sorry that Cindy's going to be leaving us, but we're also going to have Rachel, Rachel Ellis. Uh, Kirk Lane, the Arkansas Drug Director, Dr. John Kirtley, the Executive Director of the Arkansas Board of Pharmacy, Justin King, uh, the Assistant Special Agent in Charge for the DEA in, in Arkansas. All of our organizations have collaborated for a very long time uh, to make this happen. But I also want to take this opportunity uh, to thank several key staff at CJI because I can stand up here and I can talk about all the great things that we do, but you know how those little mice on my shoulder are. Uh, it's folks like Matt Modrak and Annette Tracy and Crystal Blakely and uh, Beth Green. These are the individuals that have done so much to help make this summit happen. Would you guys help me give them a well-deserved round of applause? Thank you. We're all here today to talk about how the opioid epidemic is impacting uh, Arkansas communities. And let me see if I can actually do, yes. We've all seen this statistic uh, that each day in our country, based on 2017 statistics, 130 people die from an opioid overdose. The 2008 data are in, and it's a little bit lower than 70,000 but if you calculate it, it's 128 people a day. Uh, it's still very difficult for me to wrap my head around uh, the true enormity uh, of all of that. But when we think about who these individuals are, uh, it's got to grab us by our heart because these folks are our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers, our friends, and our neighbors. We all know, each and every one of us, uh, know someone who was touched by this epidemic in some way. Because of the number of opioid deaths we see in our country every year, and now we're starting to see also an increase in, in suicide, which some people think the two are in some way connected, at least uh, in, a, in, a, in a small fraction of a way, we've actually seen the life expectancy in our country decrease for the past three years in a row. That's unprecedented since the 50s uh, and 60s. In Arkansas, because of the key leadership of the key partners and our willingness to all collaborate, we've had great strides in enforcement, treatment, uh, and prevention. Because our primary goal is to reduce the number of opioid overdose deaths in our great state. We at CJI were very proud to be an important part of the prevention efforts, and we're actually helping to save lives across our state. Through our naloxone programs, and it's a partnership between the Drug Director's Office, the Criminal Justice Institute, and numerous state, local, and county law enforcement agencies across our state, so far we've been able to save 340 lives with naloxone. These are 340 people who are alive today because these individuals wanted to help them. The White House Council on Economic, oops, I guess I'm not in the <clears throat> technology swing of things, my apologies. The uh, White House Council of Economic Advisors recently estimated the economic cost of the opioid epidemic in this country is $696 billion, and that was for the year 2018. If you remember, not too long ago, that estimate was about $115 billion. So we're seeing a tremendous increase in how we're calculating the costs because we're seeing more and more of the impact that can happen. These costs really don't include what I like to call the impact to the other victims of this epidemic. These are unfortunately the all too often for forgotten victims of illicit drug abuse. These are of course our kids. And these are the kids who live in homes that are negatively impacted in many ways because of the illicit drug activities of their parents or caregivers. 
There's been a lot of talk today, and rightly so, for a very long time about how very, very important it is that we provide treatment for those individuals struggling with a substance use disorder. I do not disagree with that. However, we have to also strongly consider the need to also make much more mental health available to kids who live in homes where there are illicit drug activities. If our intention is to break the cycle of drug and child abuse, these children need as much or more treatment than their parents. Many of you have probably seen this image. It was a uh, posted on social media, went viral, uh, Liverpool, Ohio. There's a couple in the front who were obviously overdosed. And then you see the image of a little kid in the back. Is there anybody in here who doesn't think that this experience was traumatic for this child? It most certainly was. But also losing a parent from an overdose or because they were incarcerated is also a very traumatic experience for the children left behind. Living in these homes takes a very traumatic toll on these children. Children that live in homes where illicit drug activities uh, are at risk of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and the majority of these kids are neglected. And when you talk about neglect, and if we look at the number of fatalities around our country, the one thing that kids die from more each year than anything else is neglect. And if you notice, if you compare these stats to previous stats, the number of kids dying from neglect every year is increasing. These types of situations present very, very stressful, what some individuals refer to as toxic stress for the kids that have to deal with them. Thanks to the great work being done across this country on toxic stress in kids and what's known as adverse childhood experiences, we know that repeated trauma and what we're calling toxic stress impacts brain development in these kids and also increases their risk of poor health and poor education and social outcomes. One of these poor outcomes is perpetuating the cycle of child and or drug abuse. Kids grow up in these homes believing that what they are experiencing is normal. We all know it is not normal. We're also seeing an increased risk now because of fentanyl that our kids are accidentally overdosing. In this particular case in Pennsylvania, the two parents overdosed in the front. They had their kid in the back seat. Kid got a hold of the drugs, and it, it was heroin, and they ended up having fentanyl in it, uh, and the kid overdosed as well. They were all saved. They all lived, but the parents were arrested for aggravated assault and endangerment of a child. As we begin to see the increase of fentanyl, even here in Arkansas, we have to realize that the risk to our children living in these homes also increases. Fentanyl is being found in heroin. They're making pills completely of fentanyl that look like Oxycontin, but they're also putting fentanyl in methamphetamine, cocaine, and also in marijuana. Until recently, there really wasn't a group out there that focused on trying to estimate, well, yeah, these are all negative impacts, but how many kids in our country fall in this category? The estimate that existed for almost 10 years was there were 2 million kids in this country that were impacted because of substance use disorder in their parents. But a new study that was recently done by the United Hospital Fund focused on just the opioid epidemic. 
and took a really, really, really good look at some of these key factors that I've also already talked about and how many, and tried to estimate the number of kids. Well, what they see or what they estimated was that there's 2.2 million kids that are impacted in, by opioids in this country. And that was in 200, 2017. And that is just for opioids alone. They also broke it out by state. And for Arkansas, there were 2, 22,000 children that they estimate were impacted. And these are not kids that are taking opioids. These are kids that are impacted because of somebody else's behavior, not their own. So we obviously realize that there's a problem. And in a lot of times, these kids aren't real necessarily being recognized. But I think it's time that we do recognize them. Obviously, I felt like it's been a time to recognize them a very, very long time ago. We're very fortunate that back in uh, 2005, and it was mostly on the wake of the methamphetamine lab problem, that kids who were impacted because of their parents or caregivers' illicit drug activities were basically, everybody's going, well, what do we do? So there was this national group and because I was involved in the meth lab training for law enforcement, we brought this group in, and it was back in 2005. We were at the 4-H Center. You notice he was attorney general back then, so that tells you how long ago it was. And yeah, that woman sitting there, she doesn't have her gray hair in her head at that particular point in time. For my friends, I just want you to note that. We had 200 people that came together representing a wide variety of different professions. And this group came in and they did the prosecutor perspective, they did the law enforcement perspective, they did the uh, social service and children and family services perspective, they did the medical perspective. And I can remember thinking, Oh my God, these are all silos. And so I walked away from there going, why don't these groups interact and try to collaborate and talk to each other more? Well, it was at that particular event almost 15 years ago uh, that I had a, the blessing of being able to uh, meet my colleague, Sergeant Jim Gerhardt uh, out of Thornton, Colorado. And he was having the same issues with all of this that I was. There was another colleague that was there, Nicola Erb, who was with the uh, National Jewish uh, Medical and Research Center, also out of Colorado. And we just kind of shook our heads like, well, what, what, how does this help us get anywhere? And so we decided to bring a group of people together uh, at CJI, and that's our old building. Those of you who know where we are now, notice our digs are a lot better. But we ended up getting 80 um, leaders from a wide variety of different professions that could possibly have some kind of contact with a drug-impacted uh, child uh, and their family. And from that and from all the discussions, we ended up developing a two-day workshop. And that two-day workshop was focused primarily on law enforcement and social services. And these two, re two professions only. Both of these professions care very, very deeply about the safety of children. But there was a lot of confusion about who's supposed to do what and what's the roles and responsibilities of everybody. So we did this two-day workshop and tried to point them to some areas where they could collaborate, talk about how important it is that they do collaborate, and specifically talk about being able to I identify these kids and their families early enough that we can intervene before we get to that stage of neglect or that stage of physical abuse or that stage of sexual abuse. And the only way that was going to happen is that if we were able to have them to collaborate. And so we did this two-day program. See all the red or all the 
counties that we've been in. We obviously covered the entire state. We covered all 28 judicial districts, and we had people from every single county that attended this program. And we talked about identifying these kids and their families. We talked about creating these opportunities to intervene on their behalf. We also talked about issues such as these kids and their families cycle through uh, children and family services. And part of the reason it may be is because children and family services are actually treating the symptoms in these kids and these families, the neglect, the child abuse. But what's the root cause of all of this? There's probably a lot of them, but I guarantee you one of those root causes uh, is substance use disorder. So what we realized is that we did collaborate. We enhanced collaboration all across the state, but our efforts weren't just be they weren't being uh, sustained. So as a process, and anybody that's you know, involved in trying to literally fundamentally change the way professions interact with each other, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, that it's going to take a long time uh, in order to get sorted out. So what I'm going to do is to talk about our journey and the decisions that we made and where we're going forward is I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant Jim uh, Gerhardt. Uh, well, thank you all for having me here. Uh, as Dr. May said, I first came to Arkansas uh, almost 15 years ago and have uh, enjoyed every single trip I've ever had out here. This is a beautiful state. You people are wonderfully friendly. I, I love working out here. It's really kind of a second home to me. And that's why I'm very vested and concerned in this problem of the opioid crisis, how that's uh, impacting your communities now and most importantly, what is it we're gonna do for the next generation? This whole effort on drug-endangered children came into my life uh, about three years before I came to Arkansas for the first time. This is a still shot from a video tape that I was, I was taking a video of our SWAT team that was doing a raid on a home. And the reason why I was taking this video if you can see on the backs of these SWAT officers, they're wearing supplied air tanks, like a scuba diver, except they're not underwater. And this was really unusual for SWAT team officers to dress with this kind of equipment. And they wanted some training. They wanted uh, basically a videotape of how they did on this so they could evaluate it for training purposes. So as they break down the door, this, this, I was on our drug task force at the time. This was a warrant that was written by my unit. <clears throat> and it was for a home where we believed there was a meth lab in operation. There were two males that we believed were going to be at the house. They were the two operators of the lab, and that's the only people we expected to find that day. However, when the SWAT team broke down the front door <clears throat> and went in, we found seven adults in the home, including this woman who was sitting in the room where the lab had been in operation with her small child, her nine-month-old child. And if you see this video, this child basically doesn't react any more than what you're seeing right here. With armed SWAT teams running in, with supplied breathing apparatus, sounds like 10 Darth Vaders in the room, very loud, pointing guns, this child sits more quizzically than he does terrified. I know my kids at that age would have screamed their heads off and looked for mom or dad to help, but this child did not. I went downstairs and I was getting other video of the house when the SWAT team brought the child out. And at that moment, I captured this image on video. And this was the moment that really changed my life because if we dress a SWAT team up in protective gear, have them wear air tanks, have a fire department staged outside in case something explodes and we need for decontamination. What in the world is a child doing in this environment and what do we do now that we found this child? So as Dr. May said, uh, you know, Arkansas was struggling with the exact same problem at the exact same time. And we were trying to think of ways we could impact this in a positive uh, manner. 
and a, and a lasting manner. One of the main problems that we, we faced, and faces everybody across the country, I don't care what state you're in, is that law enforcement's operating within its own silo, its own entity. Child Protective Services operates within their own. Medical community operates within their own. And when you have a problem like this, you would think there are protocols laid out on exactly how to handle something like this, and that's not true. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we don't even talk to one another. The police handle something, don't even call Child Protective Services and vice versa. It's a system that we felt had to change. It just has to change. We cannot do that. Uh, when, we, when we bypass other systems and other professionals, we cut off avenues of resources and information and expertise that can only help in a situation like this. So if this had occurred about a decade earlier, it wouldn't have been a meth lab we were talking about. It would have been crack cocaine and that epidemic and the impact on children then. Now we're fast forward a decade and we're talking about the opioid crisis. There's always going to be something. There will be a next crisis as long as, how many people in here by a show of hands work in prevention? Awesome. If, if we're ever going to get anywhere on this problem and not have the next epidemic, I firmly believe it's going to be because we have prevention efforts and a mindset and a culture in this country that is not glamorizing, glorifying, and, and socializing all of these substances, whether you're talking alcohol, marijuana, methamphetamine, whatever, we know what the devastating impacts of these substances are on public health and on public safety. And right here, when we look at children, we see this impact firsthand. This is from Massachusetts, this photograph. It's part of a video that was uploaded uh, by the uh, police department in Massachusetts, the Lawrence Police Department. And it's a woman who has taken so much of some type of opioid that she has literally crashed in the aisle of a toy store while her child is with her screaming, trying to wake her up. And they've got this all on video from, from this jurisdiction. You know, en enough is enough. I mean, really, I, I just don't know at what point we say enough is enough. Um, because the next time you, we're going to get on top of this opioid problem, it's going to take work, but all of you are engaged. There's people all over the country working on this. We're going to battle it back the way we did methamphetamine, although meth hasn't gone away, but the meth lab problem certainly isn't what it once was. We'll get a handle on this at some point, but what's next? Is it going to be designer drugs, uh, K2 and spice and those kind of things? Is it going to be this marijuana legalization with the potencies of these products never before seen in the 90% THC range for some of these, uh, these uh, things you can smoke, things you can consume? Who knows what's next? It's scary to think about what's after this epidemic. But hopefully we can start to set up a structure where we, no matter what it is, we push back against it in a lot of different ways. And one way is to take that next generation, those small kids that are growing up in these homes that see this as normal behavior, and find the right intervention to get these parents back on track so they can have their children, the children can grow up in safe environments where this is not an influence or an impacting factor. And that's a, that's a lot of work. As a matter of fact, because the drug epidemic in this country is ever changing, we, through Dr. May, took this program and said, you know, if we're always talking about the drug of the day, we're always kind of a step behind. We really need to look at what is driving child maltreatment in general, and we need to bring intervention to child maltreatment because we know drugs and alcohol are going to have a huge impact in that world, but there's a lot of other times when child maltreatment occurs where there aren't drugs and alcohol, and we need inter intervention then too. So if you guys can take a look, there's no audio on this particular piece of video, but you might remember this from a couple of years ago. This is a football player named Ray Rice who's having a dispute with his fiance, and he is handling it by punching her and knocking her out. And we all remember this video, we all remember the outrage over this video, and it was absolutely warranted, 100% warranted. This should be something, another issue in this society. When are we ever gonna tackle this? When are we ever gonna say this is wrong? I mean, we do say it's wrong, but when are people gonna get the picture on this? When you look at the way that this happened, 
Um, there was a lot of outcry and outrage, and rightfully so, but there was another incident that occurred right around the same time involving a different NFL player, a guy named Adrian Peterson, who decided he was upset with his child and took a switch off of a tree and started whipping this child repeatedly. And there's some photographs of some of, some of the injuries. There's many, many photographs of what he did to this child. Here's a little bit on what it was. 10 cuts on the thighs, marks on the back, cuts on the hands, open wounds to a very small child. What struck me at the time was that the outrage over Ray Rice, which was completely justified, did not seem to appear against Adrian Peterson, which to me is equally justified. As a matter of fact, there were people that defended Adrian Peterson and said, well, this is just parenting. You know, I'm, I've been a law enforcement officer long enough that there was a time when people would beat up their spouses and we would treat it like it was just a thing that happened in the home. We would go and we would separate people and we'd come right back an hour later and they'd be at it again and again and again. And eventually that stopped, or at least it slowed down because Colorado was one of the states, as many states, that adopted a different legal philosophy around spousal abuse. But where child maltreatment is concerned, this has been a struggle in this country for 100 years or probably more, certainly more. If any of you know this little girl, picture of this girl, Mary Ellen Wilson, she was a, a young girl who was growing up in a New York borough who was repeatedly beaten every single day, screaming, screaming through the neighborhood. You could hear the screams through the neighborhood. And there was a Christian missionary not far from where this girl was being beaten every day who went to the police and said, you, you have to do something. This little girl is just being tortured and beaten every single day. And the police said, there's nothing we can do. That there's no law against it. The person's child is their child. So they weren't satisfied with that answer. They went and started seeking a legal remedy because there wasn't a law prohibiting this. And they had to reach out, of all places, to uh, the uh, Humane Society because they had enacted laws that prevented animal abuse. So at this particular point in time, beating your dog like this, which is a horrific thing, was made illegal, but beating your child in the same manner was not. Isn't that amazing to think that child abuse laws are based on animal cruelty laws, not the other way around? So uh, this just indicates that we are evolving as a society, and we're slowly evolving, in my opinion, to tackling this issue of child maltreatment in the way we need to. And now we have all this drug activity and drug abuse, and it's just fueling more and more and more of this maltreatment. So when I think of family violence, and when I say violence, I don't necessarily mean always beating a child, but I do mean neglecting their well-being, neglecting their care, putting them in harm's way where they could literally die. Uh, there's, there's two different responses we see, as I've said. Spousal abuse, which gets a lot of attention, and child maltreatment, where too many people act like, so what? They never say that out loud. We always say, oh, we're doing everything for the kids, we're doing everything for the kids. If any of you work for school districts, you know that's a lie. You're not getting the money that you need to, to be funded and to do all the things for kids. Anybody in here work for Child Protective Services by hands? Okay, you know we're not doing everything we can for kids. You, you folks do some of the most important work in our society, and yet the stress that's on you, the amount of caseload you have, would, it would break the normal person. And yet you folks do this all the time, very heroically. And I think part of the reason why this is the case is because over time, women stood up and said enough. Women are primarily the victims of spousal abuse. They said enough. Women have power. Women vote. Women can make noise. By contrast, children don't do that. Children can't take to the streets, and even if they could, they can't vote, they can't, they can't influence elections directly. So I think they've been forgotten more than, they, more than we want to let on. And that's what our program is designed to not forget them, to get intervention for them. However, what we also don't want to do is jump into programming where we inadvertently cause issues that we didn't intend to cause. 
So Dr. May has instructed us on our project that as we move forward, we'll, we want to do things with an evidence-based mindset. And evidence-based policing for the law enforcement in the room, this is kind of a newer concept. If you're in medicine, evidence-based medicine has been around a long time. But it's from evidence-based medicine that policing is now starting to change how we're doing business. We're starting to do things more experimentally. We're starting to run pilots. We're starting to do things and collect data so we can make some assessment about whether we're having impact. And it's a good thing. And we want to do this because we want to know that what we're doing at the end of the day is efficient and effective, but we also don't create some inadvertent harm as a result. So in 2016, we revamped our program. We decided to still continue to do two-day workshops, but build it around a structured program, which ultimately will lead to community accreditation in this particular effort. Um, so in order to do that, we had to really look at standards and practices and different uh, things to bring into this process in order to then give communities the tools they need to implement and then ultimately be accredited. We realized you can't do this in two days of training. You can't walk into a, a, a room and train in two days and walk out and ma expect magic's going to happen. We think this process really is going to take at least a year for communities to get through. It's taken longer for our pilot communities because we're building it as we go in some respects. But these counties here were the first ones to be involved, Garland County, Saline County, and White County. Since that time, we've added four additional counties. And these are our seven pilot communities. And what we're doing is very in-depth work trying to get their systems to start interacting with each other as they move forward to not only help bring intervention to children, but to recognize traumatized children and to work with schools and others to reduce trauma, to do trauma-informed care. We also have a statewide group of leaders that are from these seven counties. They show up at CJI once a quarter. We just had a meeting the day before yesterday with this group, and they are helping us drive this forward. This is multidisciplinary. We have people from different professions, even uh, some representatives from the governor's office attend and from other, other high up places. So uh, this, this program is designed that hopefully we can bring it to your community and have it as a statewide pro project at some point. Uh, but there are 25 standards in this program currently that have to be met in order for a community to be accredited. And it's everything from policy implementation to uh, training requirements to documentation and data collection. It runs a gambit of things. It's not necessarily easy, but it's important. There are, I guarantee everybody in this room represents some industry or some interest that could be and should be involved with our community programs. However, in order to start somewhere, we had to identify what we felt were the core entities. Believe me, it's not saying that anybody else isn't valuable, but these are the ones that the government basically, uh, these are government-run entities that have an expectation to be on the front lines with children. So that being law enforcement, child protective services, schools, the Crimes Against Children Division of the state police, and uh, community corrections officers. All of them represent either one of two systems, more or less, other than perhaps schools. Schools are kind of a different system, but a very important component. Uh, most of these up here represent either criminal justice or human services systems. Both of these systems are large and have a lot of things to offer. Um, we've really started to hear a lot of people pushing back against criminal justice intervention in the last few years, claiming that it's nothing but incarceration. If you talk to any police officer, I can tell you, we all believe that people have to work super hard to actually get incarcerated. You have to like mess up a ton of times or you've got to do something really super big and bad. But the idea that we have jails full of nonviolent marijuana users, first, first time marijuana users is absurd. It is not the case. Um, the criminal justice system is really more about a lot of intermediate intervention to prevent people from getting into the prison system. But that only occurs through community corrections. Do we have community corrections folks in here? By show of hands? Excellent. These folks in community corrections bring the most diverse and powerful components of the criminal justice system to bear, especially on this particular problem. 
but it can't happen without law enforcement intervention. So what we try to do is, is get everybody to understand that these two large systems are already engaged in intervention in one way or the other. We want them to get together and work more collaboratively. Because currently, and this is true pretty much anywhere in the country, if you're a mandated reporter or you're somebody who believes there's child maltreatment happening, some child's being abused or, or, or harmed in some way, neglected, you have the option, you don't realize you do, or the general public doesn't realize it, but they have the option of engaging one or the other of these systems, but typically not both. And that comes from whether they do choose to call 911 and report the incident, or they call the child abuse hotline and report the incident. And think about how crazy this is. Same exact conduct, same exact family, but today I see it and I call 911, I get a police response that may completely be independent of Child Protective Services. And the true is also the other way where people report to the hotline and Child Protective Services deals with these things and never let law enforcement even know that it's occurring. They're we, we, when we do this, we are just cutting off multiple avenues for information and intervention resources. We have to bring this together. We have to create a system, and this is what we're doing in those seven counties, where it does not matter whether somebody calls 911 or the hotline, these services are going to come together and they're going to discuss the best route for that particular family in that particular situation. Arrests are not mandatory. Child removals are not mandatory. In fact, child removals are discouraged whenever possible. We want children to stay with families and their parents as much as possible. But sometimes removals have to happen because situations are so unsafe. Sometimes people have to be arrested because they've, they've allowed conduct that they just can't allow. Those things are going to happen. They do happen in these systems, but it's really about trying to bring everything together to have a unified response instead of a siloed response. At the end of the day, what it's about is trying to motivate people to do something different, to go from the wrong caretaking, the wrong behaviors that are leading to children getting harmed, to the right behaviors. So in a little, in a little illustration here, it's a little bit like trying to get a horse to move. You can use carrots and you can use sticks. Carrots are the reward you dangle in front of the horse and it tries to get the reward and it walks. Or the stick is, if it's not walking, you smack it, it feels the pain, and it goes forward. Not, if you use only the stick or you use only the carrot, it's, very, it's rarely effective for the long haul. But if you combine the two, carrots and sticks, you have a much better chance of changing behavior. In our analogy, the carrot is often those who work in human services. They provide a lot of very positive resources for getting people to change behavior. Criminal justice is more of a stick. We're more about accountability and about criminal sanctions, which also are very motivating for people to change behavior. The problem is if the carrot is human services and the stick is criminal justice, we tend to see each other in very one-dimensional terms, very stereotypical terms, and we don't want to work with each other because of, because of those stereotypes. So we have to break that down. A lot of what we do in those two-day workshops is breaking down those barriers to stop labeling each other this way and actually work together. So I'll give you just a little snapshot of what we're learning. Um, in our seven pilot communities, we have them do an after-action report every single time they have a child maltreatment event where they collaborate, which is all of them. Um, for a six-month time period. We collect this information for six months. This is part of when they're implementing. This list of factors up here that you see are the triggering events that we tell them when you have these situations, you need to start calling other services. You need to start working together on a plan of action when there's children involved. The numbers to the right are the number of events that have been reported so far with all of our seven communities combined. So as you can see, the number one factor that is really impacting this particular project is in fact drug endangerment. But it's not, these things are not just reported when there's drugs, these, these events are reported whenever there's maltreatment. That's the key, whenever there's maltreatment. So a lot of these things up here, there's no indication of drugs. 
although we always look for it, we always look for it, whether drugs are a factor in whatever has occurred. We, we in this country are neglecting our children to death. This program is about saving lives. That's what it's about, plain and simple, saving the lives of these children. What we've come to find also in our after action reporting is that uh, among our seven communities, 69% of the children that have been involved in these interventions are under the age of 10 years old. What's interesting is when you look at national statistics about child fatalities, it's actually a bit higher of a percentage, but that's a, that's a chart about fatalities. The number from Arkansas is about maltreatment, all maltreatment. But if you can see the number of children under the age of at least 11, 8 to 11, uh, from that point and below, that's our most vulnerable children to be injured or killed, killed in this particular case, that's what the statistic is, due to maltreatment, neglect or abuse. So very much similar population that we're serving here to try to protect. Another thing that really fascinated us, Dr. May and I had to actually take a double take on this one when we pulled this statistic. In our pilot communities, we break down the uh, abuse or neglect by offender type and look at how often it's actually the mother that has come up in the, the biological mother that has come up as the uh, person where there's at least an allegation, if not a founded case of maltreatment. What's also interesting is when you look at national statistics, we see that 41% of the time we have the biological mother who is also the offender nationally. So what's interesting about that is, is when you think about spousal abuse, you're talking primarily about men that commit that offense. When you're talking about child maltreatment, we have a whole lot of moms, surprisingly and scarily, that are actually involved with child maltreatment. We also have them report out the different drug types and substances that are involved in the different uh, cases that they're working when drugs are a factor. And this is how that's working out. Marijuana is a huge component, uh, more than alcohol, more than methamphetamine, which are tied for number two. We know there's probably a lot more opioid cases that are occurring, but I think we're still having a learning curve on some respects in the local communities about about that issue. It's a little easier to disguise because of the prescription drug problem, but we do include prescription drugs in our count. So um, we're seeing that rise anyway, for sure. A couple years ago, that number was very, very low and it's going up on the opioids. Another thing that we ask everybody is, would you have collaborated in this child maltreatment uh, case, would you have collaborated before this program came in? That's what we would call traditional collaboration. Non-traditional is they're actually calling each other now in instances where they didn't used to. That is a huge improvement. That's almost doubled the number of times that these industries are, these groups are working together in dealing with child maltreatment. I think that number could be even higher, but that's, that's what it's showing us at this point. So I, we're really, really happy that everybody's working together. And we also want to find out how much conflict that's creating. Are these groups fighting with each other because they've never worked together before? And we're finding that only there's in 248 cases, people indicated things have gone great. There's been no problems. In only 10 cases, has there been some kind of conflict or disagreement? I know it's kind of flipped the way the verbiage is on the slide, but everything, the yes means, the yes actually means things are going good. The no means it's not going so good. I know it looks a little different from how it's titled, um, but that's another positive thing. We're seeing a lot of people in communities that are working together in ways they never had before. Our overall goals for this program, there's a lot of them, and we really do believe that in the long haul we're going to have impact on these. Some of them we can probably get impact on in the short term, but we want to know things like if you look at uh, what's causing kids to not graduate high school, what's driving disciplinary actions, you can look at those individual factors, but if you look back at the family history, educators tell us there's a lot of dysfunction, perhaps abuse and neglect going on in those homes. If you look at children that enter the juvenile, the criminal justice system because they're stealing cars when they're 15 and 16, or they're committing burglaries, or they're getting involved in drug activity. Everybody who's involved in those cases can look back and say, There's, there are indicators of abuse and neglect in these homes that, that predate these kids getting involved. So if you think about everything, child fatalities, the number of severe cases, 
can we actually, if we address maltreatment early, can we actually have an impact later on? We want families to be together. We want families to be safe. We want kids to grow up with their parents. We need these parents to change their behavior, plain and simple. And in some cases, some parents are not going to ever change, and we have to change the circumstances for those kids. But that's rare, and it should be the last resort. And that's what we, we very much preach in this program. The last thing I'm going to show you is uh, a news report in Colorado that came out um, about 11 years after we did that meth lab raid on that little boy. We had a reporter who went out and actually found him again to see whatever had happened to him and how he was doing. And this was at the time when we were trying in Colorado to get a bill passed in our legislature to identify and define what a drug-endangered child was. It didn't give us any new authority or power, it just provided a statutory description so that the service providers could continue to work intervention and had a common definition to work from. And I'll tell you how that went here in a second. Early on CBS 4 tonight, a father and his young boy talk about their frustration in trying to protect Colorado's children. With marijuana now legal here, many want to better define dangerous drug environments that children may be exposed to. CBS 4 Jennifer Bryce joins us tonight and you showed us video of a 14-month-old boy saved from a meth lab when he was just a baby. Well, Jen, he and his dad hope that their story changes laws at the Capitol. They really do, and they're passionate about that story. And here today at the Capitol, Karen, a group of child advocates and lawmakers got together to discuss this bill. This is actually in committee right now, and that meeting was still going on when I left just a few minutes ago. But it is a story that Brandon has to tell you that really puts this bill into perspective. <laughs> 11 years ago, this police raid on a Thornton meth home opened their eyes to children living where drugs were being made. This terrified 14-month-old baby became a poster child for advocates who wanted to toughen the law so children would be better protected. That little boy is now 12. Just, some of these parents, they just don't understand. Brandon Campbell and his dad, 11 years later, are still hoping for better laws. It, it, it just saddens my heart that, to know that I wasn't the only child. Does it make you angry? A little bit, yeah. Keith Strickland didn't know Brandon's mom, Heather Campbell, was living in a drug lab when he dropped the boy off for the day. Campbell got 25 days in jail for their son being in that home. Stood up in the middle of the courtroom. You gotta be kidding me. That's it? That's all the law will allow me. Advocates now want to broaden the law to more than just a child found in a drug lab. They want to define what a drug-endangered child is. Nicholas Anathasiao has just arrived. He just honked the horn. This undercover video of a former El Paso prosecutor buying cocaine with his kids in the car is an example. So is this house fire that started because dad fell asleep high on drugs. Now we're in a crisis phase because we have marijuana legalized, we have prescription drug abuse, at, at one of the highest rates in the nation. We have to do something. For kids like Brandon, who says he hasn't seen his mom in seven years. Because she thought that if I was with my dad, I would have a better life. And he does, but not all drug-endangered children end up like Brandon. So the, the, good news, the good news of that story is that we did bring intervention to that situation and Brandon has a fighting chance. He lives with his father and he's doing well. It was kind of by accident that that happened though because we didn't have a structure, we didn't have a program to really build off of. And that's what we're trying to bring to everybody here is a program, a structure to make sure this happens 100% of the time. Um, just as an aside, um, if any of you have ever worked on legislation here in Arkansas, like back in the meth lab days, if any of you ever worked on trying to get pseudoephedrine, which is the precursor for methamphetamine that comes in Sudafed tablets. If you ever tried to get that to where it was a prescription only drug, I'm sure you faced all the fight and pushback from Big Pharma, who comes out because they're making so much money off of the sales of that stuff that they, they fight it and push back against it. If you are experiencing the same thing with anything on the prescription drug front, you might have the medical community pushing back, you might have the, the, the uh, uh, Big Pharma pushing back. In Colorado, we have all that, plus the marijuana industry, which is extremely powerful, 
very well funded. They were, they were the ones they, who were able to actually tank that bill, which again did nothing more than provide a definition. It, it was authority we already had to deal with. It was authority Child Protective Services already had, but we wanted it better defined and it didn't, it, it wasn't saying marijuana. It just talked about controlled substances, any type of controlled substance. But they were able to push back enough because they felt that it, it was essentially an, uh, a covert attack on legalized marijuana, which is a very big problem in my state, and it does drive a lot of child maltreatment. So the best of luck to you all. I love my time here in Arkansas. I love working with the people in your communities. And I think uh, Dr. May has us on the right path now to actually provide permanent intervention uh, methodologies to impact this problem. So I'll turn it back over to her. Great. Let's give Jim a big We're uh, very grateful to have Jim here and the amount of time that he's uh, invested. I know we're out of time, but there's just a couple of things in closing that I want to say to you. Uh, first and foremost, the drug-affected drug children in Arkansas have not been forgotten. Uh, it's through this multidisciplinary collaborative effort where we're asking everybody to fundamentally change the way that the professions are interacting so that we can benefit the drug-impacted kids and their families. And remember what Jim said, this is not about breaking up the families. It's about healing the kids uh, and the families. And lastly, what I want to say is that CJI did not do this alone. This is a, a program that's unlike any other program in the country, and it's because of what we've done through collaboration. And I want to say how truly grateful I am uh, to all of our key partners, the Children and Family Services, Community Corrections, the State Police Crimes Against Children Division, uh, the Division of Elementary and Secondary Education. That used to be the Department of Ed until the transformation. And last and definitely not least, many local and county law enforcement agencies, because they're truly committed to helping drug-affected kids and helping us all break this cycle of drug and child abuse. Thank you. All right, seventh inning stretch. We are almost there. Everyone can take a brief break. If everyone can be back in this room at, what time is it now? 3.30? 3.45 is when we are going to begin our last session and stick around because this is going to be one of the most powerful sessions of the day. So for 3.45, back in this room. Thank you.
four people whose lives have been touched by addiction. And I'm proud to say that all four are my friends. And I only met them th through sharing my own story of how I was touched by addiction, how my life has been touched. So I am so looking forward to you hearing their stories. They, all four of them speak with such a passion and have such a heart for what they do. Our first speaker, he needs no introduction, but I will give him one. Jimmy McGill, I'm sure many of you know Jimmy McGill. He is, I would say, one of the most positive people I have ever met in my life, and he does not take no for an answer. Is that right, Jimmy? It is very true, he says. Jimmy is actually a nationally certified peer recovery support specialist, and he's truly been a leader in the movement that we are doing here in Arkansas. And not only that, but Jimmy's life has been touched by addiction. I'm gonna let him share on that with you. I am proud to call Jimmy a friend, and I am proud to introduce him here today, Jimmy McGill. Crazy socks, right? We're gonna bring some life to the stage now. No. <laughs> Hey, uh, thank you guys for coming out. My name is Jimmy McGill, and I work for the Office of the Drug Director and D-A-A-B-H-S. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's a privilege to be here today. And what I want to talk to you guys about is stigma, right? Um, and so when I think about stigma, I want to call it what it is. It's discrimination. It's us picking and choosing who has a right to live and who has a right to die. Stigma is a killer and it keeps people like myself who are in recovery from drug addiction uh it you know stigma kept me in addiction for a long time it keeps someone uh, afraid to ask for help afraid that we're going to be judged and people are going to be condescending to us right like I, I heard speakers throughout the day in the recovery panel who are successful productive uh citizens today one of them had 16 years in recovery right and today was the first time because of their career that they ever went public with their recovery 16 years that's an amazing thing that we should be able to share but stigma kept her from being able to because she's afraid that she wouldn't be accepted in her workplace and that's a form of stigma and so you know the the definition of stigma of course is you know, a stain or a mark on somebody because of a circumstance, right? Like I spent my life in the grip of addiction, in and out of incarceration. And I understand what it's like to look at life through stigmatized eyes. I know what it's like to be judged. Okay, I get it. I'm a person of addiction, but I'm so much more than just a person who suffers from the disease of addiction. I'm a father. I'm a worker, I'm a contributor, a taxpayer, a homeowner. I get to pick my kids up tonight when I leave here, right? I'm not just a person in recovery from addiction. One of the ways that uh, we try to overcome stigma in the state of Arkansas is spread awareness, right? And how do we do that? The more we talk about recovery, the more we talk about this and humanize it, the less it can be ignored. Right? I saw recovering people today from all walks of life sharing their hope, sharing their story. I saw a chemist. I saw a pharmacist. I saw a, a master level social worker all sharing their personal recovery in front of hundreds of people today. Right? And the more we talk about this, the less it can be ignored. That's how we overcome stigma. We share our stories. You're going to hear uh, from some amazing people in their stories, right? Their trials and tribulations with stigma. I've lost a number of friends this year that didn't want to ask for help because they were afraid of how they would be treated. And that's ridiculous, right? Like it's time for us to pull our community together. That change is going to start somewhere and it's got to start with us. Um, one of the things we recently did, and I want to talk to you guys about this, was a, a kickball tournament. Some of you guys may have heard about that, where law enforcement came together and competed in an all-day event against people in recovery, and I will say we whipped their butts. Yeah. 
And I told Kirk Lane and Sheriff Staley that they weren't going to win because we had been running from them our whole life. <laughs> and it was amazing, right? Like this day, the true stigma was broken. It was shattered. You had people in recovery from addiction hanging out with the same law enforcement officers who once arrested us, who held us accountable. We were sharing our stories. We were getting to know each other and not from the backseat of the police car. We were overcoming our differences. We were taking pictures. We were shattering the same thing that keeps us stuck in hopelessness. And, and it was amazing, you know. Uh, you know, we had Officer Tommy Norman out there. Lord forbid, uh, he almost got eliminated, right? Uh, a recovering person collided with him on the, so uh, on the kickball field, and, and he hurt his knee. And so it's really cool to see recovering people reaching out to him afterwards, you know, sharing his picture, sharing posts. And uh, that's what we've got to continue to do. We've got to continue to speak up about drugs. We've got to continue to spread awareness that recovery is real and that this addiction doesn't discriminate against anyone, right? Like anybody can be touched and affected by addiction. I am proof of that. Uh, Chris Dickey, you're going to hear from him in a minute. He is proof of that, right? Like we can go on and become successful, productive people. I want to thank you guys for coming out. And uh, I would like to encourage you, if you're a person in this room and you're in recovery from addiction, you should feel obligated to share your story, right? The more we share our stories, the more lives we save. We encourage people to come out and share their stories, to ask for help. We introduce the solution that recovery is possible. It's real and it does happen. I haven't put a drug or a drink of alcohol in my body in almost five years, man. Recovery is real. And so I'm not gonna take up any more time because I started a few minutes early and I wanna make sure that Chris has enough time to talk and I get to introduce him. Uh, that's a long bio, I'm not gonna make that cut. But Chris is uh, the CEO and founder of Natural State Recovery. He is a peer, he is an advocate, and he is a person of long-term recovery. He is someone who I find myself on the phone with a lot because a lot of times I don't know how to face problems, right? And so I call someone who's been there and who can help me get through it. And Chris does that, and he's an amazing person. Chris. Wow. What a beautiful crowd. I have these uh, prepared remarks, and now that I'm looking at all of your wonderful faces, engaged. I think I'm just gonna do something that, you know. Let's speak from the heart. I owe it to you. I'm just kidding, I've got my, my, my <laughs> I saw that in a movie once and I always wanted to do it. I wanna second Dr. May in, in how she gracefully gave appreciation for the organizers of this event and um, to the leadership of what it takes to put something on like this, not just this one day jam-packed event, but to inspire and equip uh, everybody in this room to take it back to your uh, uh, communities. Um, addiction is a disease. However, this does not in any way excuse responsibility. Just as with every other disease, diagnosis requires adherence to a treatment plan. Designating addiction as a disease is not a free pass. You heard Jimmy just talk about how he gives me the responsibility sometimes to help him through problems, which is equally uh, helpful to me, and that's just kind of how it works. In fact, it establishes expectation. Recovery, though difficult, is attainable. Um, you know, s stigma is an attitude, a tr an attribute, a behavior, or condition that is socially discrediting. Stigma involves three elements: a lack of knowledge, 
negative attitudes or prejudice, and people behaving in ways that disadvantage the stigmatized person, discrimination. Stigma can negatively impact a number of areas, including the willingness to attend treatment and access to health care, harm reduction, self-esteem, and mental health. You know, illicit drug use is the most stigmatized health condition in the world, with alcohol, with alcohol use disorder not far behind at fourth in the world, amongst a list of 18 of the most stigmatized conditions internationally. Several studies related to the stigma of substance use disorders, including one which showed that portraying opioid use disorder as treatable may help reduce stigma associated with the condition. It seems obvious, but that's what research supports. You know, language really does matter. We've heard that theme throughout today's conference. In a study regarding language and its effects, researchers were interested in whether the language we use to describe individuals with substance-related problems may evoke different types of stigmatizing attitudes. The study done by Recovery Research Institute had participants who were asked how they felt about two groups of people actively using drugs and alcohol. One was referred to as a substance abuser. The other person as having a substance use disorder. No further information was given about these hypothetical individuals. And so the study discovered that participants felt the substance abuser was less likely to benefit from treatment, more likely to benefit from punishment, more likely to be socially threatening, more likely to be blamed for their substance-related difficulties, and less likely that their problem was the result of an innate dysfunction over which they had no control. The substance abuser was seen as having, not choosing to pick themselves up by their bootstraps and fix the condition. The interesting part of this study was half the participants worked in the healthcare field. 20% were students, 29 worked outside of healthcare or were unemployed or retired and 5% did not report an occupation. I love that we're talking about what we're talking about today and seeing the person as they are, as a person, and, and, and changing the way we talk about how we approach the addi addiction medicine. I personally am in long-term recovery. I've been uh, sober for 12 years and I'm very, very grateful for that. Thank you. And, and just to say, I've never met an alcoholic in recovery that doesn't believe that this is the best thing they've ever done for themselves, which would be contradictory to <laughs> why does this person continue to choose this over that? And so, what I've learned over the course of those years and the years uh, trying to find a way out of the, the pain and, and shame that addiction brings is my past does not equal my future. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and you should know how humbled and grateful I am to be one of your speakers today. In high school, I didn't make it across the finish line. Actually, I was voted most likely to be on COPS uh, from the yearbook committee. And, you know, I kind of wore that as a badge. I felt, uh, you know, that's damn right. Um, I was in trouble with law enforcement. So, you know, the, those yearbooks, if you go back and look at your yearbook, and this says most uh, likely to become president, most likely to become an actor in Hollywood, and then you got Chris, most likely to become a COPS. They were actually really close to that being true, but they're completely off on the other ones. They always are. I lost an, my identity in sports and gave them up to party. I, I overdosed at, and was treated at the hospital my mother worked at, so uh, bringing to light at her workplace uh, the, the problems that we were trying to conceal was another level of uh, shame. And so active addiction ripped and roared through our lives. Many people gave up on me. However, at my lowest point, 
completely broken, the recovery community showed me grace and introduced me to a new way of life that has brought unimaginable prosperity to me and my family. Today, I'm a doctoral student, a homeowner, a business owner, a contributing member to, to my community, a governor appointee, a friend. I have a daughter who's never seen me in active addiction. In, in, you know, I've, I've told Dr. May this story uh, before that you know, being able to break the cycle of addiction in a generation is something that uh, it, it would be enough. I get to be a mentor today, and the point is, I'm more than my addiction. God doesn't have grandkids. We're all his kids, and we need to do a better job of taking care of one another. And I'm going to share one more uh, story with you about wrapping our arms around this problem together so we can equally find a, a viable solution. And Laura mentioned it's going to take all of these silos building a bridge so we can work together. And it's a story about Warwick the Mule. Warwick the Mule is about a mule. And it takes place on a little dirt uh, road in, in rural Arkansas. And it's, this guy's from the city. He's driving down the road. And uh, he, he's selling door to door. And uh, he, the, the, the day's coming to an end. And so he's tired. And he overcorrects himself on this dirt road. He's not used to driving on him. And uh, finds himself in a ditch. And he gets stuck pretty good. So he's outside of the car, kicking the tire, you know, cursing. Uh, up a storm and, and just, you know, angry that his day has, has come to this. And so he starts walking in this direction, looking for a, a solution, and he comes upon this little farm. On that little farm, no one answers the front door, and he's about to give up. As he's leaving, he sees this little shop with a light on, and so he makes his way over there, and he finds this little farmer tinkering with some different tools and such, and he tells him the story about what happened to his car, and the farmer scratches his head, looks around, and says, well, sir, as you can see, that all of my farming equipment's been out of commission for a while. Um, but I think we can go get Warwick. And he said, what's Warwick? <laughs> and he said, oh, it's my old mule. And the guy said, I, I don't know if you understand that my car's really stuck, and I don't know if this is going to work. But the farmer convinced him to give it a try. And so they both... Uh, the, the two of them and Warwick made it down to that car. They hooked him up uh, with the, the, what would it be called, the device that you, the harness. And um, just before the, just before um, this, this event took place, the little old farmer starts calling out these names. And he says, now Laura, Kirk Lane, Dr. May, Jimmy, and Warwick. Just as that mule heard its name, it kicked into gear and without even a hesitation was able to pull that car out of the ditch. No problem whatsoever. This guy was so excited. He's jumping up and down. He gets to continue his day and go home. And uh, he, he's, he's hugging the farmer, jumping up and down with joy. And he's, he, just before he leaves, he says, um, Mr. I, I'm so appreciative that you'd take your time to come out here and help me. But why did you say those names before you called out Warwick? Farmer looked at him misty-eyed and said, well, you see that uh, my old mule's been blind for a few years, but if he believes he's part of a team, he can pull his own weight. Isn't that what we're talking about and doing together today? Thank you. Thank you for cleaning up your paper that you threw so ferociously. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Dickey. Um, our next speaker today is Paula Cunningham. And Paula, oh, she's right over there. She's ready to roll. We're ready to go home. Yes, she is. Uh, Paula is the manager of medical policy administration at Arkansas Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, but she comes here today in the capacity of a mother whose life has been touched by addiction. I'm honored to have gotten to know Paula over the past few years. And um, you can take it away. Paula's like ready to roll. So I'm going to have you come on up. Please welcome Paula Cunningham. Thank you. 
don't know if I'm ready to roll or not, but I'm going to. Um, so I've sat out there where you are the past two, three, four years as an employee and someone who is passionate about this plight and this fight. And it's a, bit, it's a big difference sitting out there uh, than it is standing up here talking. But I wish I wasn't qualified to speak on the matter that I'm gonna speak about today. But unfortunately I am, and I'll get that to, to that in a moment. But I, I do wanna thank you all for being here and for this being important enough for you to be here and, and stay the whole day, I want to thank the state of Arkansas, um, the Attorney General, Director Lane, Dr. May, all of the other people in the state of Arkansas that are fighting so hard to end this epidemic. And I want you to know, I see what you're doing, and I thank you on behalf of me and all the other moms and family members who have lost someone to this disease. So two years ago, I sat where you're sitting, listening to all the speakers, and my son was actually relapsing at the time. I was receiving calls from family members. I was receiving texts from him. During break, I would go and I would try to talk him off the ledge. I was praying that he'd be strong and he would reach out for help. The people sitting next to me, they didn't know about the chaos that was going on because that's what happens. It becomes chaos when someone is in the active addiction. I was sitting there fighting the monster on my own. In the middle of the chaos, I would continue to live as if my son wasn't slowly dying. And through the help of Al-Anon and the 12 steps, I actually worked the 12 steps myself. And, and through that, I learned that I didn't cause it. I didn't cause this disease. I learned that I couldn't cure it and I couldn't control it. And I learned that I needed to take care of myself and get to work on fixing myself. And I'll tell you, I still do that every day. I've got a long way to go, but I needed to let God and Parker take care of fixing him. And so that took a lot of pressure off of me. And I have slides. Yes, I do, and I have a clicker here. Um, but I want to in introduce you to my son, Parker. Um, there he is. He passed away on August 29th of 2018. And I'm a mom, so I brought pictures. You're just gonna have to indulge me, okay? So the first one, the little angel, that was one of his least favorite pictures that anyone ever took of him. But of course, it's now my favorite because it kind of, if you're a mom, your child is your little angel. And he'll always be my little angel. He had a sweet, kind, generous, and gentle heart. He loved people and he cared about people. And if you knew him, you would remember that about him and you would know he had the best hugs, the best hugs in the world. But he did all the normal things that other kids do. He played baseball, football. He was horrible in football and he hated it, but he, he tried it. He uh, competed in archery and duck calling. He was very good at both of those. Just normal, normal things. And he graduated from high school like other high school students do. But when Parker graduated from high school, he had already completed 90 days in a residential treatment program. So when he graduated, he got a job. He was a hard worker. He went to work, making good money. Life hit, cravings hit, and he relapsed. And he would do that several different times, many different times throughout his uh, addiction. He tried several different types of treatment. He tried medication-assisted treatment. 
He tried different residential treatments, intensive outpatient programs. He really tried hard to overcome this, and he didn't want this. These pictures right here, that's the Parker he wanted to be. You see, one time when he relapsed, he overdosed and his friends took him to the emergency room. The people he was using with took him to the emergency room. They gave him Narcan and he survived. He drove himself home from the ER to my house to let me know that he had just overdosed and he needed to go back to treatment. And that night we had conversations and he cried and he cried and I looked and I saw physically the weight of his illness, this disease and all the shame and the guilt that people had heaped on him and thrown on him and all of the shame and the guilt that he threw on himself for not being able to stop and not being able to get past this. And he, he said, Mom, I just want to be normal. Someone else said that. I don't know who it was today, but he said, Mom, I just want to be normal. And he was looking at me like I was normal. That's crazy. <laughs> but he said, I want to be the, the son and the uncle and the brother and the grandson that, that you guys deserve. And he didn't understand why God didn't just take this away from him. See, he would pray about it, and he didn't understand why, why he couldn't get over this. And he was desperate for help. And he was terrified. He was terrified he wasn't going to survive this. He, he knew the chances of overdose were high with the heroin addiction and he was terrified and you see that's what people don't understand about this illness and that's what I want you to know and that's where stigma comes in you see stigma is rooted in the misconception that someone struggling with a substance abuse disorder can control it and is therefore to blame and that is wrong that's wrong because as we all know addiction is a disease. And I want you to know, and I want us to remember that people, that people that are suffering from this illness are people like you and me, and we have to stop blaming and we must treat them like people. And I also want you to know that stigma and shame kills. Why do I say that? I say that because studies have proven that stigma affects the willingness of someone to seek treatment. And it also affects their success in treatment. And without treatment and recovery, the, the risk of death is high, especially now with fentanyl and all of the drugs on the street. So stigma, stigma kills. And I believe that stigma affected my son's recovery. He he came to me and said he wanted to try medication-assisted treatment. How many people know what medication-assisted treatment is? I always like to ask that because many times I go and speak and no one even, or very few people in the audience even know what it is. Medication-assisted treatment has a stigma all on its own. It has a big black mark. Um, Parker wanted to try it. And I told him as long as he went to a good center with combined counseling and um, therapy, accountability, that I would support him in that. I had done research on it. I knew that it was a viable treatment option. I don't know and would not say that it is the option for everyone, but I do know that proven, it's been proven to reduce overdose. And he wanted to try it, and so I supported it. He was doing very well in his treatment. He moved back home at that time and was living with me while he was in treatment. 
and we had great conversations. I saw him, he was not in a recovery center and he was doing well. He was embracing his counseling, he was going to meetings. He, for the first time, would tell me that he was enjoying talking to his counselor and he would talk to me about things that he had discussed with his counselor that had not happened before. And so I saw him doing well. He was doing so well that he started thinking about what he was going to do with his future. And he always wanted to be a farmer. My family farmed. And he always wanted to be a farmer. From a very young age, he had to dig in the dirt. And he could get in those large tractors and drive them. And I still don't know how he did that. <clears throat> but that's what he wanted to do. That was two hours away from Little Rock. He was going to have to travel two hours back and forth to treatment, to continue his treatment, because there was not a provider in that area at the time. And at about the same time as all this was happening, people started giving him stigma. They were telling him he didn't need to be on the medication-assisted treatment because he wasn't a junkie living on the streets. They said that word. And they also said, you know, I, I've been through this, I've done this, the 12 steps, and, and, and you just need to, to buck up and, and, and just quit. You know, you don't need to take this medicine to stop. Words are powerful. We've talked about that today. The words that we use matter. I also got the same stigma. People talked to me negatively about the fact that I was supporting my son in this type of treatment. And I'll tell you, even though I'd done the research and I knew it was a viable option, it bothered me and it got to me and I started questioning myself, am I doing the right thing as a mom? And so I feel like maybe I didn't stand up enough for him when he was receiving stigma about it. So what if? At this point, I like to always say, I could blame. I could what if and if only all of this journey that me and Parker were on. And when he passed away, he was in the hospital on a ventilator. And we were preparing to donate his organs because Parker always told me if anything ever happened to him and he was in a place where he could donate his organs, he wanted to help save someone else's life. And so we did that. And at his bedside, I had a choice to make. I could be angry. I could get angry at all of the people that didn't do the right things. I could be angry at myself. What if I had done something differently? And I could blame people. But I chose to accept. I think you said that earlier, Laura. I chose to accept what God had given me. And I chose to accept it with gratitude, and that was hard, and that sounds crazy, but I learned a long time ago that in any situation, you can find something to be grateful for. And so I held his hand, and I thank God for the time that I had with him. I thanked him for the 20 years, and I came up with several other things. The point is, is I chose to accept. But I also later said, what if? You know, as a nurse and a researcher, I thought, what could we do different? And what if we had done certain things? Would that have made a difference? And so I came up with a list of things that I would like us to consider today and that I've been considering. What if stigma wasn't a factor? You know, what if Stick Parker didn't have to face the stigma of his disease? Would he have chosen to seek treatment earlier? Would he have talked to me about it earlier? You know, I didn't know he was struggling for many years. Would he have talked to his PCP, his primary care provider, when he went in for, for something and told him that he was struggling? I don't know. And I don't know if it would have made a difference, but I believe going forward, if there's no stigma, then people will seek treatment earlier. And I think it will make a difference. And so I'm glad that we're having this hour to speak about stigma because it is important. What if Matt 
was offered, MAD is medication-assisted treatment, what if medication-assisted treatment was offered in the ER, and what if a peer recovery support specialist was in the ER? So when he overdosed, instead of the nurse handing him a prescription for Narcan and saying, hey, get this field, you're going to need it, that's what they told him, that was his discharge instructions. What if they had said, you know, a peer recovery support specialist would have come beside him and said, hey, you know, brother, I've been through this. I know what you're going through, and I want to walk with you. And what if the doctor had said, I can start you on this medication so that when you leave here, you're not going to go in withdrawals and immediately want to use again and potentially overdose and die. And tomorrow I can get you in a treatment program. What if? Would that made a difference? I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's something we need to think about going forward, and I'm proud to say that already in the state of Arkansas, we have two hospitals, UAMS and St. Vincent's. There may be more, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but at least two in central Arkansas that now have peers employed in the hospital. <laughs> Yay. And thank you, Arkansas, Jimmy McGill, and all of you uh, peers that, that are sharing your story and working hard to walk alongside people who want to get treatment. So yay, that, that's exciting. What if there was more medication-assisted treatment providers in rural areas? We have come a long way, but there's still, still a lot of areas that don't have the providers. What if providers or residents were actually given the training while they're in school and, and given the chance to be wavered while they're in school and their residency program so when they get out, they're already ready? Um, I think that's important to think about and consider going forward. And finally, what if medication-assisted treatment was offered in the residential treatment program? You see, Parker had a cycle. He would get treatment, and then he would go into a recovery housing, and he would work, and he would get money, and a craving would hit, or life would happen, and he would relapse. And he kept doing that. Uh, and what if? What if he had started, they started the medication assisted treatment while he was in recovery, so he was dealing with the trauma that he had experienced as a child and he was being given tools to, to use to deal with life. If he had been started the Suboxone, the medication assisted treatment while he was in recovery and then he, when he got out and dealt with life, he wouldn't have to worry about the cravings. Would that make a difference? You know, I can't what if, and I don't know, but I do know that it's, I think, important for us to consider those things going forward. And so last, what now? What next? What now is that we have work to do. I encourage you all to leave here with a renewed sense of urgency and commitment. This is important. People are dying daily. Commitment to go out and do what you can do to make a difference. Doesn't have to be large, like Laura said earlier today, because small gestures make big impacts. And if we all do something in our community and we all come together to fight this, we can end the battle, but it's going to take that, all of us coming together. You know, I don't want any of you here today, or anyone for that matter, to have to be here next year sharing your own story of loss. So I thank you from my little cowboy <laughs> for letting me be the voice that he can no longer be. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Paula, for your bravery in coming up here to do that. Know that it is not easy to come up here and share, especially as a mother. So we appreciate you so much. I never like this thing. Uh, everything happens for a reason. If you are someone that is grieving, you know that's one of the things you never want to hear. But I do like to say that I have found purpose in my pain. And our next speaker, I feel like embodies that. 
Gina Allgaier is the executive director of Speak Up About Drugs. After losing her son, she has made it her mission to educate other parents. She has found purpose in her pain. Gina. Okay, sorry, we're getting to the end of the day, so thank you guys for being here. Um, you know, I was asked to come today and share what our organization Speak Up About Drugs has been doing um, to help fight the opioid epidemic. But two years ago, completely shattered after the loss of our son Tristan to an overdose, um, I stood up here, just like Paula did, and shared his story. And just like for Paula today, it, that's hard. It's hard to come up in front of a whole room of strangers and talk about your child's addiction. Um, but I stood up here with some other, other parents and we shared our stories. And, um, you know, it bonds you in a way that you just can't be prepared for. Um, at that time, there were many other families here in the state of Arkansas who had also lost children to this. And the numbers were skyrocketing across the country. It was 2017. And now looking back, we know we lost more than 72,000 Americans that year to overdose. And about two thirds of those, I think, were to, op to opioids. But as a parent on this unexpected and very frightening journey, with our child, you know, we didn't know where to turn. We didn't know who to talk to. And that was partly because of the stigma associated with addiction. It was also in part because of a lack of resources um, for the ones suffering from substance abuse disorder, and especially for their families and loved ones who were dealing with the ripple effects of it. As Paula said, it's very chaotic. Um, there was a lack of education about the highly addictive and deadly drugs that are on the street today and also that are in our homes today, that are in our medicine cabinets and on our kitchen counters. Um, there was a lack of information and understanding about addiction as a disease and how these drugs rewire the brain. And, you know, there were changes that weren't yet happening in our judicial system. So sentencing guidelines, they hadn't adapted to keep up with the low weight, higher potency drugs that the dealers were using to improve their profits and meanwhile killing our loved ones. Um, the public really wasn't aware of the technology, how technology is being used to really perpetuate this drug culture and the existence of the dark web and, you know, ways that things like payment apps and digital currency were being used to facilitate drug deals. So net net, there was just a tremendous amount of work to be done. Um, and at that time, the Attorney General and, you know, Director Kirk Lane and the DA and CGI we're all beginning to really champion initiatives in Arkansas. And so, you know, things to spark change. Um, it was very inspiring. And so we decided to found this organization um, to help break the stigma and use our authentic stories to um, speak up and help do our part. The idea was to model SAD after um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, after MAD, whereby parents, individuals, organizations could come together as a united force to help others, to heal ourselves, and to drive systemic change that's needed here in Arkansas and across the U.S. So the framework that has evolved for our organization is what I call the PSA model. But basically it includes prevention, support efforts, and advocacy. And um, our members who are directly, you know, have been directly affected by substance abuse disorder can come on and really contribute where they're most passionate, um, in areas that they're most knowledgeable about, and really work together to help bring about this change. Some of the prevention efforts um, involve working with state and community leaders, state and grant funded organizations to help augment their work. And so things like this, to come out and do speaking events, to share our authentic stories. Um, recently, we were honored to partner with 18 pharmacy students from Harding 
and they helped us to act, activate the pres um, prescription drug take back events with Walmart through um, a partnership that we have with them in 24 stores across the state. Some of the support efforts um, that we're involved in, one is called Courageous Conversations. It's a newly launched meetup, what I call a meetup for really, I guess, a support group for parents and individuals who um, have been directly affected by substance use disorder and who are on you know, this addiction journey with a loved one. And so in those, you know, in that group, we're really um, providing and learning tools to better navigate the addiction journey. And, you know, helping the parents who are trying to deal with this practice self-care so that they can in turn be better equipped to help the loved ones in their life. And then advocacy initi initiatives um, for those in Arkansas who are battling addiction, who are ready to make change, we've launched a referral line, a hotline, and so we use a database to help provide the right treatment for that individual based on their specific needs and offer a little bit of case management support to help walk them through this process, um, including some advocacy um, during the court process as well. So I have a video I'd like to share that um, gives you a little bit of the highlights of what it is we've all been um, building and working on together. And hopefully this will work. fortunate enough to have the opportunity to go through the SPART program. This program has helped her power through her teenage struggles. Not only has this program been absolutely amazing for my daughter, but also for me as a parent. Hey, what you taken away from today? Whatever inspired you to do this and pull your bones out. If there's specific colors that you need to help out, I'm going to have the music playing. Well, we started Spark because we wanted to help people strengthen their coping skills, teach self-management and self-discipline, but do it in a peer environment where hopefully we can start creating peer communities, sober communities, and provide resources. And we added the activities as a way to help bring emotion to the learning and help hardwire that learning into the brain. And so out of that, Spark was born. to fill that void. 
with substance abuse, to understand why you're dealing with substance abuse, and how it has a trickling effect on everything that we do within our family. So when these families learn to cope with uh, substance abuse, how to manage it, how to um, stay engaged and, and communicate, but also um, how to sustain a healthy family lifestyle so that we don't have to deal with uh, these type of issues. It's been a busy two years, but there is so much more work to be done. And as we've all said today, it's going to take all of us working together to help break stigma and to end this epidemic. Um, there are other grassroots um, organizations that have started in the state since 2017, born out of the same pain that our family has experienced, and all doing great work. Um, one of them is the Matt Adams Foundation. They're out there on the front lines distributing naloxone kits to those, you know, who need it and training them to be able to administer it. And another is the Hope Movement who creates those beautiful and really impactful banners that you've seen here today out in the breakout sessions. Um, those banners are being used across the state and around the country to help make an impact wherever they can. So whether it's with organizations who mobilize awareness walks or whether it's attending you know, court with a, a parent who's going in front of the legislature or um, you know, whatever is being done in churches and just across the country to help make impact, they're creating these you know, banners as a reminder of all of those that have been lost to this senseless and devastating epidemic. As parents grappling with the epidemic, we're shattered. You know, we are just shattered by the loss of our precious children. But there are so many more parents that are broken, you know, by watching their beloved struggle because of the disease of addiction. Um, one of my favorite sayings now, you know, is as Ernest Hemingway said, we are all broken. That's how the light gets in. And when that light gets in, it really leads many of us to work together doing the best we can to do this really, really hard work to turn our pain into passion with a mission of hope, of helping other people every day, saving lives one conversation at a time, to break stigma, to wipe out addiction, and hopefully present, prevent any other family having to suffer this devastating loss of their child. I want to bring up, I think, Director Lane now to say a few words and close us out. Um, but thank you all again for being here today. Um, this is my third year to be here, and every year the content gets better. It gets more real, and we have just stronger attendance. So thank you for your time. Well, I'm here to close you out, I think. So I want to make a few comments because I kind of get inspired every time I listen to, especially our parents and speakers speak. And one of the things I want to talk about just really quickly is stigma. So if you indulge me with this, how many of you guys got a flu shot? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have gotten an antibiotic for an infection in the past? 
How many of you have taken an aspirin for a headache? Oh my God, everybody's on medication assisted treatment. Wow, it's no different. It's the same thing, we shouldn't stigmatize it. So I think about different things and I usually use this to close out and I think it's appropriate. But first of all, I wanna thank the AG's office, uh, Rachel Ellis, uh, all the partners that put this together, Dr. May, John Kirtley, DEA, all the different partners that we got to spend all year with uh, every month trying to find a time to make a meeting to make this all possible, to put out this education because it's so important to the community. But when I was growing up in the 70s, I didn't have friends that died of a drug overdose. And I look at naloxone reports on a daily basis and the people who are dying a lot of times aren't our kids, which we put so much emphasis that we have to protect, which we should. But more importantly, it's our parents or those kids' parents that are the ones that are overdosing. And so we have to put that education into our parents because those are the role models for our kids and what they see our parents do a lot of times are those kids' role models. So think about this. For the third year straight in our nation, life expectancy for a U.S. citizen has declined. It's gone backwards. With all the medical advances, with all the technology, with all the medicine, with all the great innovations that we have in our nation, life expectancy is going backwards because of overdose and suicide. So is there a correlation between overdose and suicide? We heard that today. The helplessness and hopelessness, a lot of times, of a substance use disorder leads to suicide. And so with suicide rate rising, is a direct correlation with that and overdose. But again, we are going backwards. And we haven't done that in our country since the flu epidemic of the early 1900s. We're in our third opioid epidemic. Had one right after the Civil War, one in the early 1900s. And think about the early 1900s is when the FDA and CDC all came to light because of all the snake oils and, and, and things that we had in our society. Sound familiar to where we're at now with what we're getting in CBD shops? And what's going to solve everybody's problem? It works. It doesn't work by scientific proof. We voted in by popular vote. Where are we going? We're going backwards, just like we are in the loss of life. You know, if we don't solve this problem that we created, and yeah, I'm a part of that. I was a police officer for 33 years. I didn't see the necessity to educate myself on the prescription drug epidemic. I didn't stand up. I did what society wanted me to do and arrest my way out of this problem. And I did a dang good job of doing that. I tried to arrest our way out of this problem, but it led us into a deep hole. It led us into over-incarceration, not solving the problem, causing people to get into a cycle that they never can get out of. And we have to change, and we have to be willing to change. And we have, it's easy to sit, especially in a social media environment that we have now, and point fingers at doctors, point fingers at everybody else, instead of pointing the fingers at ourselves because we created this problem. And so here we go. If we don't fix this problem, if we don't solve the epidemic that's killing in the last year 188 people a day, we're gonna be the first generation not to leave it better for the next. That's a fact. We've become a greedy generation. It's all about the profit and it's not about the quality of life or what it's putting our families through and we have to change that. So with that, I saw today that you're a very tough audience. Very rarely with such inspirational speakers did you stand up and give somebody a standing in ovation. But I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna change that right here and now. So if you're a parent or if you have lost a loved one to an overdose or a substance use disorder, please stand and remain standing. Stay up for me if you would. If you're in recovery 
or been in recovery or substantially through recovery or work with people in recovery, please stand up and remain standing. If you have swore an oath to protect and serve or protect people in all works of your, works of your employment, please stand. And finally, if you are here today to make a difference in your communities and this state, please stand. Give yourselves another hand. And that's been said so many times today, together we can change the course. We can defeat this epidemic. Thank you very much. I know y'all are running for the door. I just want to say one more thing before you leave. There is hope. Can you repeat that with me? There is hope. One more time, louder. There is hope. I hope you leave here today with that message and know looking around this room that we had 1,200 people in this room all working together to solve this problem. And I know that if we continue to do this, we will make a difference. Thank you all so much for being here today. Don't forget when you leave to turn those evaluation forms in, uh, the attendee form, you can do your evaluation form online. Thank you all so much for being here. We hope to see you right back here next year.